Belum. Bel belum. Isinya baru mahasiswa. Sekarang aku tersadar. Saya tunggu tak tunggu. Jeffrey, Mama Jeffrey, tolong uh, Mama Jeffrey. Oh ini ini. ini. Mama Jeffrey, tolong dipindahkan hostnya ke saya dulu Jeffrey. Halo, Mama Jeffrey. Oh iya Pak. Tolong dipindahkan uh, hostnya, klik di partisipan itu. Terus Pak? Terus di partisipan itu ada nama saya, ada gambar uh, apa kamera yang di garis merah itu. Klik itu ada more tulisannya. Ah, Oke, okay, udah. Udah Pak? Udah, udah. Masih ya Jifri ya? Iya, sama Pak.
Hello, Dewi. Dewi, tolong di unmute apa ya, Dewi?
Oh, Assalamualaikum Assalamualaikum Bapak dan Ibu, mahasiswa semua. Waalaikumsalam Pak Natona. Waalaikumsalam Pak. Pak Yu, apa kabar Pak? Alhamdulillah sehat. Izin bergabung Pak Natona. Ya senang Pak. Terima kasih Pak. Ya, Pak. Pak Hayu, Darman Munir, kemudian Pak... Pak Man, apa kabar Pak Man? 
Udah sarapan, Pak. Parman sah. Alun bapun suara rupanya. Masih <laughs> pagi hari ini. Yolah. Lasur, jasur. Masur. Segala sur, ang. <laughs> Di sini juga ada Pak Datuk kelihatan, Pak Zul Fadri. Assalamualaikum Pak Datuk. Assalamualaikum Pak. Sehat Pak. Alhamdulillah sehat. Hujan di tempat Bapak Anda? Enggak lagi mendung Pak. Mendung ya. Mendung Pak. Sama Pak. <laughs> Iyalah kita masih menunggu ini sampai jam 9. Sesuai dengan jadwal ya. Bu, Bu Ketua ya. Bu Yeni. Terima kasih Pak Yu, sudah bergabung nih Pak Yu. Siap, Pak Yudi. <laughs> Sehat Pak Yu. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Lala mu nak sebut Pak Yudi. Iya. Malah ada corona-corona ke, tidak bisa gabung-gabung pek-pek kami. Ya <laughs> bakurang ini ya. Ya bakurang segini lah <laughs> Pak Edi pulang kampung ke Maninjau, Ma. Iya, Pak. Aku duduk di tepi kabun mana. Awak <laughs> oh, nak pandai untuk itu. Tuh. Apa yang di belakang awak itu nak nampak? <laughs> di apa ke, Pak? Di video ke, Pak? Di, ada di bawahnya, nah. Pak. Cus awak di jual api, Ma. Oh, di jual api. Iya, iya. Nak pandai awak dah. <laughs> Tidak 
Nak lu misalah P1 Juli September ndak bakal baju. Remun tiga wale entah yon entah indah. Anguilo remun Oktober apa P1 Oktober Desember. Wah oya onan tu. Lun badari yang dari paman. Ah lun lah. Iku hari tinggal dua hari lainnya. Senin, Senin Selasa, hari Rabu lah cuti bersama lo, kan? Iya yeah, iya yeah, bang. Tak keluar aja, tak ada di Oya undang dia. Iya iya. Cuti pun tak malam mulu dah, apa? Ya. Tidak sanggup bayar, tutup undang. Tanggung bagu luang pak ya. Kepailitan itu pak. Iyalah. Itu kan lah hak awak tu, lawak kerajaan kan? Berarti kan mangkir terhadap putusan Menteri Keuangan. Surat SK Menkeu itu kan jalih itu. Iko tidak dijawab sedikit pun. Jawablah anda sanggup buat mai, buat mai sanggup lima puluh persen untuk P3 Wale itu, P3 Wale. Akan lama dengannya. Iko bentuk masuk kalau kulkas saya anu diam dingin. Saya dah buat tu di info sosial sebentar ini tak dibayarkan P1 sampai Desember ataupun Remun 13 kita ajukan mesti tidak percaya pada pimpinan universitas. Kita galang jawabannya klasik tarui kita kehilangan 32 miliar tahun lalu je. Mengapa hilang ni? Lalu yang sebalunya polisi kan? Kau polisi kan tak muah lah dah. Nah, kalau tidak mau berarti kan ada apa dengannya? <laughs> ada apa? Halo? Ya ya Pak Man, lagi terangkan Pak. Mau bisa kalau telefon masuk tu kadang hilang suara Ombo. Oh, tapi kan. Atau mesti yang telefon tak ada orang tolak sih. Tapi kalau MR yang telefon tu jauh itu. Langsung lah. Apa ya ni? Apalah liau jauh hal dewa kini. Ya mungkin sama ada maaf awak Pak. Ya nomornya yang muncul cuma nomor, enggak nama. Iya iya Pak. Entah Pak Pak Abu Fi ini pono. Siapa Pak Palokola? Palokola Hunan. Ibu. Apa Bu? Apa bu? Uh, awak ada awak uh, kamera HP yang yang tak pakai untuk zoom abu? Assalamualaikum Bapak dan Ibu 
Waalaikumsalam. Dan paman, eh, ya, maaf saya terlambat masuk. Eh, kita lagi mencoba menghubungi Eni karena tidak biasa-biasa dia seperti ini. Eh, Salah. Biasa tuh maksudnya apa tuh Bu, oh, Bu Pi? <laughs> Biasanya dia pagi udah bergabung, eh nggak ada Bu Dia segala. <laughs> ya, uh, saya mencoba beberapa kali menghubungi ini, mudah-mudahan uh, cepat kita takut nanti ada apa uh, uh, misunderstanding dengan waktu. Uh, karena kita kan membuat dalam waktu Indonesia ya. Hmm, saya coba hubungi beberapa kali lagi, mudah-mudahan bisa terhubung. Tapi saya sudah bilang kemarin itu WhatsApp kita di waktu Indonesia, time-nya Indonesia time. Mudah-mudahan nggak ada terjadi perubahan apapun. Bersabar ya Bapak-Ibu, karena kita masih punya beberapa waktu, jamnya jam 9. Kita mulai di... Mungkin masih lama, karena apa? biasanya mereka kan tepat waktu. Jadi mungkin 5 menit sebelum apa aja, tapi baru mereka, apa Bu, Bu Aninya join. Iya. Oke, saya coba hubungin dulu uh, Bu Diah dan... Uh, Pak Anatona, Pak Man, silakan ya, okay. uh, greeting dulu. Hai Hayu, maaf Hayu, tadinya Uni, Uni pikir bisa ini cepat karena Hayu bisa ngobrol dengan ini juga ya karena mau ke Queensland ya Yu. Eh, amin, amin. Uh, Mohon bantuan kemarin, dan doanya Un. Iya kemarin Eni bilang bahwa Ayu sedang mengurus untuk LOE katanya. Iya ya Un. Uh, dan memang ada ke sedikit kerumitan karena mereka lockdown, jadi memang butuh enam bulan dan paling cepat enam bulan katanya gitu. Siap, Untuk siap. Uh-uh. Ya. Sebentar ya, Un, kita hubungi dulu. Silakan ya. Pak An sama apa? Uh, Hayu, kita tunggu. Maaf nih, close sebentar ya. ya. Silakan, silakan Bu. Aman di situ cuaca ada man, siko kau hujan bentuknya mulai mendung. Nah, siko lah kencang angin na. Kali tidak dah. Tapi camelo, wah baru sudah mencuci baru. Itu pak pak Nathan lah gimana? Mendung mendung bu, mendung. Mendung. Di sini mendung cuma anginnya ya. sudah mulai mendapat pesona. Kayaknya mau hujan itu berat. Mendung tidak berarti hujan, Pak Natona. Iya, iya, betul. Tapi kalau sudah hujan, biasanya tidak lama setelah itu. Iya. Angin maksudnya. Ada mahasiswa kita di sini, Pak Ayu. Insya ada, Pak. Ada ya, dari HI, Pak, ya? Ada ya. Kemarin kan sudah disebar juga dia. Oh, iya. hmm. Berita gempa di pantai selatan Jawa Barat lima ya, kita harus waspada, Padang juga sudah sering digoncang gempa beberapa hari ini. Ya. Ini udah masuk kayaknya, Bu. Bu, ini. Halo, maaf. Ah, halo, ini. Maaf, ada masalah dengan um, uh, my internet connection. So, mudah-mudahan sudah diperbaiki. <laughs> Selamat pagi Bu Eni Polman, saya Halo. Dia. Halo Dia, terima kasih banyak atas um, menjadi moderator. Oh ya, yeah. for such a person like you. <laughs> oh dear. That's an, that's an honor for me. <laughs> no, 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 I thank you very much for your time. Um, I am just going to check um, the internet screening. Is yeah. that okay? Yeah, Karena sure. ada video kecil yang mau disiarkan. Okay. So I'll just, I'll just check dulu. Uh, sebentar. Oops. Okay. Yud, Yudi. Yudi, tolong jadikan ibu host, Yud. Yudi. 
Yud. Yudi. Yud, tolong jadikan nih Bu House. Iya, yeah, iya yeah, Bu. Aduh, ini salah pula karena termasuk si ini. Oh, Sylvia. Sylvia Estekip. Ini kenapa jadi host ini? Iya, yeah, tiba-tiba ini masuk untuk apa, Bu? Tolong Sylvia. 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 Iya, yeah, Bu. Tolong jadikan Ibu Yeni Narni jadi host. Sylvia. Iya, Bu. Tolong jadikan... Di klik partisipan itu Sylvia nanti ada nama Bu Yeni Narni, ada lambang kamera, kemudian ada tulisan more di bawahnya Mac House. Sylvia. Ada Sylvia. Iya, Bu. Tolong, tolong jadikan saya host. Lihat gambar kamera. Iya. Di gambar kamera itu ada warna biru. Gambar kamera. Aduh, ya Allah, ini anak nggak perlu bisa. Klik partisipan dulu, Sylvia. Klik partisipan. Nah, tolong di get you. Iya, Bu. Sylvia, udah di klik partisipan ya. Udah jadikan itu, Bu. Make host, ya. Oke, thank you. Ya, yeah, Bu. Halo. Halo, okay. Anne. Halo. Can you yeah. let me share screen? Uh, nanti mungkin ketika kita mulai ya. Ya, yeah, yeah, tapi saya mau cek dulu kalau um, in, uh, video bisa um, jalan. Oke, okay, sip. <laughs> Oke, okay, sip. Coba dulu, Anne. Oke. Oke. Pak Rumbar juga masuk. Aku cari sekarang. Taiwan, and I went to public school in New York City. There were Hispanic kids. Bisa didengar, kan? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. yeah. All right, all right, great. Oke, okay, sip, dan Halo, Assalamualaikum Bupi. Ah, ada Alhamdulillah Pak Rumbardi udah masuk Kita masih punya waktu 10 menit lagi Any, this is Pak Rumbardi Our second vice dean Halo Pak Halo 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 Ya Halo 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 Ya, mungkin sedikit terlambat kita Pak karena uh, ada beberapa hal teknis yang bisa kita yang sedang kita usahakan untuk uh, apa tadi uh, apa uh, untuk bisa jalan internet connection macam-macam lah Pak. Uh, jadi mungkin kita menunggu mungkin sekitar 9 lewat 5 mungkin kita baru mulai ada Budiah juga di sini ada Hayu dari Visip. Oh ya. Uh, Ketua Prodi bukan Hayu ya? Uh, sekarang jadi wakil dekan 3 on. <laughs> Selamatlah Pak Ayu <laughs> Dengan dekan baru ya Iya, iya, iya Bu Jadi wakil dekan Maaf <laughs> Ayu, Ayu, ya Allah Terasa adik juga Maaf ya Ayu Padahal adiknya udah jadi orang Udah oh, ben, 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 ben. Biasa aja ben. Ben. Aduh, maaf Uni ya Ayu Ya, biasa Terasa um, masih ya. adik aja juga Maaf, maaf <laughs> Selamat Pak Ayu ya Selamat ya Selamat, Terima kasih Pak Natana oh. mm -hmm. Amanah Pak Iya, amanah, Pak. Ya. Hmm. Mahasiswa kita gimana, Pak Man? Eh, Pak, Pak, Pak Anatona, Pak Man, Pak Yudi? Iya, sudah di Sudah ada yang nampak di tadi. Sudah diingatkan, Bu. Mungkin beransur-ansur mereka masuk. Iya, Masih dengan alasan yang sama. <laughs> internet. Tapi memang internet ini ya Ani baru saja bilang ya di Australia pun tadi sempat ada masalah. Ya, yeah, maaf ya karena um, ya yeah, saya tidak tahu kenapa tapi um, internet uh, di rumah terputus tapi masih ada internet di uh, pakai data di HP. So <laughs> saya senang pakai HP. <laughs> oh. <laughs> ya. Yeah. Yeah. Jadi tidak di Indonesia saja ya ada masalah dengan internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Di mana saja? <laughs> Di Australia ternyata juga ada. Iya. Tapi 
saya bisa pakai video juga. Oh ya, ini. Oke, okay, selamat pagi Bu Ani. Selamat pagi. <laughs> Kelihatan wajahnya. <laughs> ya, maaf, selamat ya, sedikit. Maaf. Enggak, 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 terlambat kok. <laughs> pagi Pak Rum, Pak WD2. Ya. Sehat Pak An. Sehat, Alhamdulillah Pak. Tambah coga sih Pak WD2 nampak. Pak dari dulu. <laughs> Mana kabarnya Pak M. Nur? Ah, Pak M. Nur kemarin sudah bisa ikut rapat ya. uh, dengan jurusan, berarti kan masih di masih. Ya, isolasi, masih dari itu dari Kampung Nelayan namanya Pak. Ya, Kampung Nelayan, ya. perkembangannya ya. Uh, membaik ya? Ma makin membaik, makin membaik. Oh ya, terima kasih. Iya, Perlahan. iya. Iya dengan istri beliau. Cuman satu kamar ya satu orang, bagus juga perawatannya di sana. Iya, iya. Iya. Kalau di rumah sakit umum enam, enam. Eh, rumah sakit jam uh, unan sorry enam. Satu kamar enam. Iya, jadi hmm. mereka campur jadi uh, sepupu dia kan dirawat lebih dua minggu dia dirawat. Jadi awalnya dia sudah negatif satu kali swab, swab yang kedua positif lagi. Jadi hmm. mungkin stamina tidak hmm. apa, karena yang baru masuk terus di kamar itu. Iya ya. Karena memang tidak cukup tempat di unan kan dia yang baru hmm. ditaruh juga di ruangan yang sama. Kalau ada yang pulang ya. Mereka isi terus dengan yang baru. Hmm. Pak Rom. Kan tanya Pak Rom. Ya Pak Man, apa kabar tuh? Cuti bersama kapan kita mulai? Rabu. Rabu jadi, sudah ya. libur? Jadi minggu depan cuma Senin Selasa. Senin Selasa. Ya, dua hari waktu kita tuh? Ya dua hari, Senin Selasa aja. Ngapsennya cukup dua hari. Kemudian November aja lagi kita masuk. Mudah-mudahan tanggal 2 ya, Senin. 5 hari. Mudah-mudahan dalam 2 hari itu aman, Pak Man. <laughs> Berjuang. Kamu tidak buat tajuk, tapi cuma miliar. <laughs> Kita mau libur panjang, kan? Iya. Nah, jadi adalah bekal dikit. Itu lah taban nambah. Nah, iya. Aduh, orang lama, Pak Man. Jadi, aku tak kira rata kalam dari beliau sebelum Pak Man. Orang lama. Kami seumur, Pak. Kami... <laughs> Kami sudah mau pensiun nanti, Pak, tahun 2026. Mungkin 2026, Pak Man. Tahun tidak dokter. Bayi setahun saja, bayi setahun saja. Oh gitu, kalau diminta awal, eh disuruh awal, nah, dibayar. Ada peraturan, kita kan tidak S3. Katanya 2025 sudah mau dipensiunkan. Oh, itu 2025 peraturan yang, yang baru. Uh, kalau diterapkan. Kan kita nggak bisa... Senaknya gitu dipensiunkan gitu kan. Kita masih punya setahun lagi masa dinas. Yeah, ya bayar yeah. di pesangon. Ya yeah, itu peraturan resmi dari Dutnaker kan? Iya. Yeah. Yeah. Gak bisa aja main pensiunkan gitu aja. Itu kan peraturan yang berubah. Peraturan sambil jalan kan. Yang parahnya, Pak Man, ah. S2 tahun 2025, ke, yeah. kalau berusia di bawah 58, jadi tendik. Dijadikan tendik, gitu. Saya di 2025 sudah 63, 64. Ya, yeah. aman. Kan banyak yang menang muda. Iya. Yeah. Iya. Yeah. Jadi kita hitung-hitung tuh lebih 30 di FIB. 30. Lebih 30, ya. Kalau diterapkan peraturan itu, ya banyak kena pindah ke TND, kan dosen. Kemudian udah mencapai hmm. umur 58, yang S2, ah, itu jadi pensiun. Pensiun? Ya, bangga-bangga umur kita sampai juga lah ke sana. Buka dulu, buka dulu. <laughs> nah, ya. Oke, okay, Wih. Oke, okay, kita masih punya waktu sekitar 5, 5 sampai 7 menit lagi. Eh, uh, Hayu oh, kenapa enggak ditegur? Iya, hey. izin izin menyapa, Un. Good morning, okay. Dr. Dr. Rani. En? Eni? Iya, ya, maaf. Ada Hayu. Halo. Hai, Hayu. Ada. Hai. Hai. 
Nesin Sıra dengar, ya iki T. Sıra dengar da iki Q. Atau belum. Karena saya masih belum. Pardon me. Yeah, I'm still waiting for a, a, a scholarship a opportunity yeah. from Indonesian government. Uh, okay. I hope so that uh, it will be running running well. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. Yeah, because at the moment uh, the LPDP uh, uh, only open for 15 uh, best university in the world. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, um, yeah, then saya dengar dari uh, graduate school that um, <coughs> paling awal mungkin pertengahan tahun depan bisa masuk karena you know masih ada apa ya the uh, border restrictions mm -hmm. dan semuanya gitu so like yeah um, saya kira ada banyak um, like yang mau mulai tapi tidak boleh sampai pertengahan like down to pun kalau yeah. kena harus mulai like the uk yeah yeah but but uh uh i mean i i already received a, a professional admission over yes, for yes. doctor of philosophy from uh, uk yeah. uh, and they said that i i will able to start my studies in the research quarter to april okay but um uh, yeah Is it possible uh, to start my my study at April or uh, it can yeah. move to uh, mid mid year? Um, I think well, well, tergantung pada kalau sudah dapat LPDP, you know, then we can apply. Then um, you know, minta izin karena semuanya harus minta izin dulu sebelum bisa masuk ke Australia. So yeah, tapi. <laughs> <laughs> prosesnya panjang juga. Yeah, <laughs> Semua yeah. proses ini panjang. <laughs> Karena oh, saya ma saya mengharapkan be beasiswa dari LPDP kalau dari kampus nanti uh, akan sangat berat jadinya. Oke. Okay. Very heavy for me, ya. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess we just uh, wait and, and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, because I have a few students who um, sedang menunggu mm. and uh, the border restrictions. Mm -hmm. um so there's a few people who are waiting to to enter australia so they can start yeah so i think i think it's a, a general problem yeah 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 <laughs> ayo selamat ya sudah dapat letter offernya ya <laughs> thank you yeah any di sini masih banyak yang ingin ke queensland and oh, ada yudi <laughs> <laughs> ada apa uh, mudah-mudahan bisa uh, apa uh, bisa bisa main bisa banyak yang bisa ke, ke sana gitu ya yeah, of course oke okay. uh, gimana uh, Budiah uh, Pak WD2 Pak Prodi uh, kita mulai atau bagaimana ini yeah. ya mulai aja mulai aja yeah, kita mulai uh -uh. Dewi siap Dewi Ya, ya, kita juga ke tangan tamu nih Bu. Ini ya, Pak Tesri ini. Oh, ada Pak Tesri sebentar Pak Tesri. Pak Tesri. Sebentar. Halo Pak Tes. Halo Pak Tes. Begini Pak. Halo Bu Dinda. Dinda Bunda ke kampus. Oh, hayo gozaimas Pak Tes. Mas. Good morning. Thank you Des. Selamat pagi Pak Tes. Ya, Pak. Ini matikan dulu nah. Ibu, Ibu duluan mau ngomong sama Pak Tes sebentar. Oke. Okay. Okay. Ini ini ada Pak Tesri. Halo Pak. Salam bisa bertemu. Halo. Lani, I'm bad at this. I'm not English. <laughs> It's okay. I'm not Indonesian. <laughs> Oke okay, ya. Eh uh, Pak Testri dari eh, FMIPA, beda fakultas N, dan eh, Pak Sesri juga eh, teman teman yang kolega yang sangat baik dengan kami di FIB dan di UNAN tentu saja. Beliau sudah menjabat beberapa jabatan penting di Universitas Sandala. Senang Pak Tes bisa bergabung bersama kami. Terima kasih untuk sapornya. Mungkin kita akan mulai. 
We, we dalam have, uh, yeah, BIM name uh, also, Bu. Uh, oh ya, yeah, ada BIM name juga. Oke. Okay. Uh, selamat. Uh, ah, sorry. Halo, uh, BIM. BIM, are you, are you with me? Halo, BIM. Oke. Okay. Mungkin uh, sedang... Halo. Halo. How are you? Fine. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We have Amy with us now, and thank you to join with this uh, yeah. lecture program. Okay. Uh -huh. My Enjoy pleasure. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Amy, ini Pak Bim dari Amy Bim from apa? Dari North North Color Colorina, I think. Carolina. Carolina. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Saya ingat dari Carolina. Aku takut sekali nih ada ada dosen speaking di sini pronoun saya hanya tuan yang tahu. No problem. <laughs> oke, okay, oke okay, kita mulai ya. Uh, dalam satu dua menit lagi. Oke, okay, silakan Dewi. Okay, everybody ready ya? Oke, okay, sip. Dengar Dewi. The honorable. The second vice dean of Faculty of Humanities Andalas University, Dr. Andres Rumbadi, MSc. The Honorable Head of the History Department, Faculty of Humanities Andalas University, Dr. Anatona M. Holmes. The Honorable Head of Lecture Program Committee, Mrs. Yani Nani, SSMA PhD. The Most Honorable, Dr. Amy Pullman. Lecture at the School of Language and Culture, Queensland University, Australia, and our moderator, Ms. Dia Cahaya Iman, MD, PhD, and also to all participants of this program. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dewi Nuryani, and I'm your host today. Welcome to the lecture program, Sunday, 25 October 2020. Today, we are going to discuss about examining sexual and gender-based violence against women in comparative mass violent context. On this special event, we have several agendas as follows. First, welcoming speech by head of organizing committee. Second, Welcoming speech by head of history department. Third, welcoming speech by second vice dean of faculty of humanities Andalas University. Next, hands over to moderator. After that, reading of the brief speakers by your data by the moderator. Then, presentation by keynote speaker. Later on, discussion session. And the last is the closing event. Okay, let's open the lecture program with Bismillahirrohmanirrohim. All right, we start the first event, the coming speech by head of organizing committee, Mrs. Jenny Narni, the floor is yours. Okay, yes. Uh, suara saya kedengeran? Hello? Yes, clear. Yes. Oh, clear. Thank you. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Praise be to God who given who given us His grace and blessings so that we can attend this first, the second series of lecture program. I would like to acknowledge the present, uh, the second vice dean, Mr. Rumbadi, MSc, and the head of history department, Dr. Anatona. Uh, and our distinguished guest speaker today, Dr. Annie Polman from Queensland University. Good morning, Annie. And it is a honor to have you here with us in this program. Bapak dan Ibu, Dr. Annie is senior lecturer in Indonesia at the School of Language and Cultures, the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. She is right about Indonesian modern history, genocide studies, and sexual and gender-based violence. And 
Her last publication is edited volume entitled The Place of Trauma Global Context with Paul Graves McMillan. And many of her books, especially in genocida case, have become referred from many resources. We are lucky today that she is willing to spend his time for us sharing her knowledge and expertise. And thank you also to Ibu Dia Cahya Iman uh, Emlit PhD that have and that all have in leading discussion today. And last but not least, I would like to thank to all of you, our guests, as well as students who are participating in the lecture program. Well, in this in this opportunity, let me brief you on let me brief you on our current lecturer program activity. This program is a new activity organized by our department, History University, Faculty, uh, Humanities Faculty, and Dallas University. This is an attempt for us in our department to stay active and productive during this pandemic. As academician, it is our duty to remind concern about scientific development despite this difficult and uncertain situation. Therefore, the scientific spirit must be maintained and continually developed. And we are lucky because before this era, technology allow us to do that. Happily, the activity runs synergi synergistically and can involve lecture and student both in terms of planning and implementation. It is planned it is planned that lecture program activity will be carried out continually by inviting researchers from foreign, country, foreign countries and Indonesia also. We hope this program will have an impact on the development of knowledge, especially in historical science. Before I end, before I end my speech, let me share some information that we are organized in, this, in the lecture program this year. This event, this, this event is running today is the second event of the lecturer program. The first program already held on October 10 with Professor Robert Grip from Australian National University. And at the beginning of November, Prof. Gusti Asnan and Mrs. Mrs. Amurwani Dwi Lestariningsi will be our next speaker. It will, it will, it will help it will held on November two. Uh, it will held on November second and November 9, twenty twenty. Hopefully, you can participate in this program. I think that's all from me. Let me close this speech with Wabillahi Taufiq wal Hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome, and I hope you enjoy our lecture program today. Thank you. Well, 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 thank you, Mrs. Yanidari. Next, we will go to the second event, the coming speech by the head of history department, Mr. Anatona. The time is yours. Thank you, Ms. Dewi, for the times. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The Honorable Daan, Dean. Suaranya nggak ada, Daan. Halo. Okay. Ya. Halo. Bisa didengar? Okay. Yes, Bisa, we can hear it. Oke, oke. Okay, okay. I repeat again. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The Honorable Dean and Vice Dean, Faculty of Humanities, Andalas University. The Honorable Chairperson and the Stream Committee of the program. Your Excellency, our speaker, Dr. Annie Pullman from the University of Queensland, Australia, and Ms. Dia Cahaya Iman, PhD, from Andalas University, as a moderator. First of all, I would, I would like to say welcome to
to all of us on virtual Zoom in the second lecture program held by the Department of held by the Department of History, Faculty of Humanities, Andalas University in Padang, West Sumatra. Then I would also like to say to all of us, wherever we are now, always in good, healthy and condition during the COVID-19 pandemic. This event is an effort to keep the academic atmosphere on the campus, especially in the Department of History, Faculty of Humanities, Andalas University, to enhance our historical knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the head of the Department of History, we would like to express our gratitude to Ibu Dr. Annie Polman, an Indonesian is from the, from the University of Queensland, who is going to present and share her new list to all of us with the interesting topic entitled Examining Sexual and Gender-Based Violence Against Women in Comparative Mass Violence Context. We also express our gratitude to all the participants from various institutions in Indonesia, including lecturers and students from several universities in Padang, such as UNP, Winnie Mambonjo, STKIP, PGRI, and of course, from the Andalas University as the house who are joining this event today. Finally, I would like to thanks to Pak Rumbardi, Magister of Science, the second vice dean of administration affair, Faculty of Humanities, Andalas University, who have and supported this event and special thank to all the committees who prepare and organize the event. Last, I wish the program running well. Have a nice event. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Okay. Okay, 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 thank you okay. for Mr. Anatona. And the last, we will hear a welcoming speech by the second vice dean of Faculty of Humanities Andalas University. Please welcome Mr. Dr. Andus Tumbardi, MSc. All right, thank you, beautiful MC. Mm -hmm. Thank you, What's your, What's your name? Dewi, Dewi Nuriani. Thank you, Dewi. Yes. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Good morning, all. The Honorable Dr. Anatona, the Chairman of the, Hist uh, of the Department of History, Faculty of Humanities, Andalas University. The Honorable Dr. Yeni Narni, the Chairperson of the Lecture Series of the Department of History, Faculty of Humanities, Andalas University. Uh, Your Excellency, Dr. Annie Pullman, our keynote speaker from the University of Queensland, Australia. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to you, Dr. Annie, who can participate and you have given your time, care, and you are available to be our lecturer today. Thank you very much, Dr. Annie. I would like also to say my thanks to Dr. Dia, Dia Chaya Iman for her uh, availability to be the moderator of the program today. Thank you, Budia. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, um, next is my, uh, my thanks also goes to all participants joining in the program today, as mentioned by pa Dr. Anatona previously. All right, uh, the Dean of Faculty of Humanities, Dr. Hasanuddin, is not in position to be with us this morning because at the same time, uh, he is attending another meeting that has been scheduled earlier than this event. He is uh, joining the meeting of the chief of clan in his village. Therefore, I would like to convey his apology to all of us uh, for not being able to be with us today. Now, I'm Rumbardi, vice dean, is representing the dean 
in this program. All right, first let's thank God that this morning we can conduct this public lecture and we wish God bless all of us for the success of this program. I mean, okay, uh, now, I, now allow me to deliver some introduction before opening this program. The topic of the public lecture today examining sexual gender-based violence against women in comparative mass violence context, it is indeed very interesting. It is an interesting as the woman herself, but not the woman to be harassed, as the topic of the lecture suggests. The problems of gender, women's emancipation, and feminism always appear throughout the history of the human civilization. Women always struggle. This struggle never ends. The woman always faces the challenge of the antagonist relation with the men, not in the relation that protects each other. I don't know whether it is true, but it is a fact as we see today in the world. Uh, does the male's egoism still dominate the woman, uh, the female today? This is question, big question. I'm sure that the lecture from Dr. Annie Pullman will surely answer all our question from, of course, particular perspective, maybe from the Western perspective. We are maybe, I don't know exactly, in the Eastern perspective. However, we also need other speakers representing the East perspective to our, uh, to counter that Western perspective. The comparison that proposes women, not as the competitor of the men, but to complete each other. And in this case, I hope, yeah, we hope, Dr. Anatona, Dr. Yaninarni, Dr. Dia Jaya Iman, and all other participants joining here today we will propose the matrilineal perspective in the discussion with Dr. Fullman today. We hope that the discussion will, 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 wide, will be widened to reach a point where there's a kind of conclusion at the end. I'm pretty sure that one of the objectives of the lecture today is to evaluate the order of human's life in order to make it better from time to time. One of them is through observing the gender relation. This lecture that we do today. So I'm sure that this lecture will, will, will be fruitful, will be very fruitful for all of us. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think we cannot wait for the presentations from our honorable speaker, Dr. Pullman. Therefore, I would like to end my opening speech. Okay, and now by saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, I officially open this lecture. Finally, I would like to thank again, Dr. Yanni Narni and all other committee members who have worked hard to organize this, this program. Enjoy the lecture and the discussion. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum. Right. Thank you, Devi. Okay. okay. Thank you for Mr. Lombardi. All right. Now we will start the discussion session, which will be led by Ms. Dia Cahaya Iman, MD, PhD. She is a lecturer at the Department of English Literature Faculty of Humanities Andalas University. She got her bachelor degree in the Faculty of Literature at Andalas University her master degree in gender studies at the University of Sydney, and her PhD in graduate school of Asia Pacific studies at Ritsu Maikan Asia Pacific University. Well, would you please welcome Ms. Dia Cahaya Iman and the PhD. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Devi. Um, thank you very much also for your um, introduction. Um, good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, um, our uh, like uh, loyal uh, participant or new participant who are joining with us today, um, 
it's an honor for me to lead this discussion. And I thank uh, Ibu Yeni Nani for giving me this uh, great opportunity to meet uh, Dr. Annie Pullman, uh, because I'm very interested in <laughs> women uh, issues and culture. So uh, we do hope that we will uh, get a lot of information, especially related to this topic about uh, gender-based uh, violence. Um, Ibu Yeninani has uh, mentioned that Dr. Annie Pullman, yeah, she's a senior lecturer uh, in Indonesian, uh, the School of Languages and Culture, the University of Queensland, and she has published many uh, articles and also a book recently. Uh, there's a book, uh, it's an article that she has written with uh, some colleagues here and also with Indonesian researcher, Debate on the Army and the Indonesia Genocide and Mechanics of Mass, ma mass Murder uh, with Jess Melvin Gatna Saptari yeah, and uh, Ken Matlia. Uh, that is really an interesting to, uh, article, I think. Um, today, uh, Dr. Uh, Annie Poman will present her uh, topic on examining sexual and gender base of violence against women in comparative mass violent context. Um, for this presentation, Annie, we will do that. Um, after you do your presentation, I will summarize it in Bahasa Indonesia. So the Indonesian um, students or who cannot really understand the full uh, presentation, I will translate them a little bit and then we will have a chat a little bit. Then after that, I will uh, give the audience for the uh, question and answer session. Okay, so um, you may start your presentation now, Annie. Great, thank you so much. Uh, let me just share my screen uh, for a start and we'll start there. Okay, can you see my PowerPoint? Yeah, you can see that. Excellent, thank you. Um, so, Slamad Pagi Smoor. Uh, kenalkan konflik atau uh, pembunuhan massal yang ber, berperspektif komparatif. Dalam presentasi hari ini, saya akan berfokus pada beberapa contoh kekerasan massal yang berdasarkan gender uh, yang saya teliti memakai metode sejarah lisan atau metode um, wawancara dalam penelitian sejarah. Tetapi sebelum mulai, saya ingin mengucapkan terima kasih banyak kepada uh, Dr. Yeni Nani dari Department of History, Fakultas Ilmu Budaya here at Universitas Andalas and to the Dean and the Vice Dean and Head of Department dan uh, dosen-dosen lain atas undangan ini. Uh, I also, saya juga ingin mengucapkan terima kasih kepada Dr. Dia Cahaya Imam atas moderating pagi ini. Uh, and I'm, <laughs> I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, tetapi saya juga ingin minta maaf sebelumnya kalau ada kekurangan dan pasti akan ada kekurangan. Uh, dan saya juga minta maaf atas bahasa Indonesia saya yang masih belum lancar, walaupun saya mengajar bahasa Indonesia, masih belum lancar. <laughs> uh, kalau ada masalah dan saya tidak mengerti, uh, saya minta tolong dari yeah, kawan-kawan. <laughs> Mungkin bisa menerjemahkannya. Um, so, I'll campur-campur sedikit, yeah. and, but I'm mostly going to present in English. Maaf, because my Indonesian is not good enough. So, <laughs> um, so I'm really going to talk about two main things today, which is about um, ideas of sexual and gender-based violence that you commonly see in genocidal episodes, okay? Second, I'm, I'm looking at three cases of this violence um, in Bosnia, in Rwanda in the 1990s and Indonesia in the 1960s, but 
because we don't have a lot of time today and each of those contexts is quite complex, I'm just going to focus on Bosnia, okay? Um, and the issues that I'm talking about today come out of a book that I'm writing at the moment with a colleague of mine from the University of Glasgow who's called Dr Erin Jesse. And our book compares genocidal violence in these three contexts. But today I'm just going to focus on the sexual violence aspects in particular. So for a, a quick outline, um, so Pratama Tama saying in Mulai Dengan Bunjalasan around some theories that have been proposed for understanding sexual violence during periods of conflict. And again, I'm going to focus mainly on the former Yugoslavia, so Bosnia, because it was during this conflict in particular in the 1990s that a lot of the, the feminist theory about sexual violence during genocide was developed. Uh, then I need to explain the Bosnia case a little bit more. And I want to show you just 10 minutes of a video, uh, which is about the town of Foča, in Bosnia, which is where sexual violence was used on a mass scale. And Akhirnya, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that I'm about the book that I'm writing with my colleague Erin Jesse and explain how we're comparing the sexual violence in Rwanda, in Bosnia, and in Indonesia. Now, I should also tell you, I'm not going to give you any um, details of any cases in particular. So don't worry about that. I'm gonna talk in general terms. However, in the book, we are looking at very detailed information about terrible things, um, but probably not for this forum. So anyway, before I go on to this, uh, I need to just give a very quick background to the context that I'm gonna focus on today, which is Bosnia, okay? Because it's a little bit, the breakup of the former Yugoslavia is a little bit confusing. Just So just very quickly. Um, Yugoslavia itself was something that was stuck together when the Ottoman Empire ended after the First World War. And it was during the Second World War that this nationalist leader, Tito, came to power. And Tito recreated Yugoslavia as a socialist state, which was based around this idea of ethnic pluralism. And so up until his death in 1980, Tito managed to keep the federation between all these different um, ethnic and religious groups together, okay? And so this included a wide range of different groups. It was Serbs, Croats, Slovenes, Macedonians, Montenegrins, Bosnians, of course, and Albanians and, and others. And some were Orthodox Christian, some were Catholic, some were Muslim, all right? Of course, uh, the victim group that we're talking about here today were Bosnian Muslims, all right, who were known as Bosniaks. Um, as you can see on the, the map at the bottom there, which is called the National Geographic Map, which was published in about 1990, so before the violence started, you can see that while particular groups were concentrated in particular areas, there was a lot of mixing as well. And so this is partly what makes the ethnic violence that starts a few years later so terrible, okay? Uh, and so the breakup of Yugoslavia begins about 10 years before the war, okay? And it's when the various states start to see a very strong ethno-nationalist dissension begin okay so you have very strongly ethno-nationalist politicians who start to whip up you know ethnic hatreds okay so people like Slobodan Milosevic in Serbia but Franjo Tuđman in Croatia and those are some examples of politicians who who rise to power on this um, ethno-nationalist uh, crusade, right? But the breakup actually starts in June 1991, which is when Slovenia and Croatia, which are up to the top left side, they secede, they, Mimisa Kandiri, 
Dari Yugoslavia, and they declare themselves independent. And this is when the war really starts, and it's this is when we start to see the beginning of the genocide. And so that's a little bit of context. Um, but to get on to the main topic, right, because it was during this conflict that there were some new terms, right, that emerged for the various forms of violence, violence that had existed already for a very long time, but they got new names, okay? So one was ethnic cleansing, right? So Pembersian um, etnis, I guess. That's how you would translate that. Uh, while some of the reporting, the media reporting, was extremely sensationalist and it painted this picture of a society where ethnicities had hated each other for hundreds of years and... Uh, there was, you know, very sensationalist reporting. Um, it was not just about ethnic difference. It also had to do with land use, religious differences, uh, perceived and real. Okay, so, for example, Bosniaks weren't just targeted because they were perceived as being ethnically Bosnian. It was also because they were Muslim, right? So it was like these two layers of targeting. And ethnic cleansing, of course, it doesn't really mean anything in international criminal law or international criminal jurisprudence, and it's not prosecuted that way, okay? But I think you can understand what it means, of course. Roughly in the 1990s, it takes on this meaning of widespread or systematic violence against a group of people based on their perceived group membership in order to expel them from the territory. So, you know, musir murakendari tempat tertentum, right? So the forms that ethnic cleansing took in these early 1990s included massacres against civilians, and then they particularly, um, men and women, but particularly men, they would put civilian populations into what were concentration camps, okay? where very little access to food, sanitation, adequate health care, um, much violence, okay? Uh, and it was these concentration camps in particular that really drew the world's attention. So there's a couple of very famous photos from that period uh, that were taken at a camp at Tropoli, uh, I can't say that properly, sorry, uh, in 1992. Okay, so that, that's one of the, the very famous ones. Uh, that man at the front there, his name is Fikret Alic, um, and he still lives very close to that camp. Um, I have a, a PhD student who is working on that particular concentration camp, and she's interviewed this man um, several times. So happily, he, he did survive, unlike a lot of the other men in that photo. Uh, anyway... Um, and for a lot of people in Europe in 1992, when they saw these images, it was a, it was a wake up call in Europe because of course it reminded them of the Holocaust from World War II and from the, the photos that had been taken at Bergen-Belsen that are the iconic pho photographs that we know of the Holocaust. Anyway, there was another new term which came out of this conflict in Bosnia. And that's really where we're looking at today, okay, which was this idea of mass rape of Pumarkosa and Masal. And so as the international media began its coverage of the conflict in the former Yugoslavia in mid-1992, much of the world heard this term mass rape for the first time. But, of course, there was nothing new about it, all right? So... Just in more recent history, there's many, there's too many examples of um, cases of mass rape, okay? So we might think of what happened to the comfort women. Um, so the women forced into sexual slavery for the Japanese army. We might think of Russian and German women who were mass raped as, well, first of all, the German army went east and then when the Russian army went west, okay, there were campaigns of mass rape during both those periods. You might think of the Bengali women who were raped in their hundreds of thousands in Pakistan in 1971, okay. But these are just 
some examples of uh, these mass sexual crimes that occurred just in the few decades before this. Okay, so rape and other forms of sexual and gender violence in conflict have a very long and varied history. And indeed, many have argued that um, for as long as there has been war, right, internal or external, um, ancient or modern, there's always been sexual violence perpetrated as part of conflict. Now, one person who's written about this is Susan Brown Miller, and I'll just quote what she said. She says, it's funny about men's attitude towards rape in war. Unquestionably, there should be some raping. Unconscionable, but nevertheless inevitable. When men are men slugging it out amongst themselves, conquering new land and subjugating new people, unquestionably, there will be some raping. And that's a quote from Susan Brown Miller. And so we get to the point where sexualized forms of violence have occurred during conflict in huge proportion in many manners and across so many places in the world that the cynicism that rape has always been part of conflict continues to serve as an explanation for the victimization itself. And so you get this perverse equation where the very pervasiveness of violence against women leads to its status as a natural byproduct of conflict and therefore to its invisibility. Right? Of course, this is all omong hosong, right? But in order to think about why it's nonsense, uh, let me walk you through just some and there's, there's many, many theories out there. I'm just going to talk about a few of them that have been put forward since the 1970s about why this kind of mass sexual violence happens um, during uh, mass violence. And so for a little bit of theory. Okay. So the majority of those who've looked at theorising about why this violence happens um, a lot of this came out of the research that was done on domestic rape settings, particularly in, in Europe and North America, okay? But particularly in the 1990s when this mass sexual violence was going on in Bosnia, um, these theorists, like, found themselves struggling to use domestic rape explanations to explain mass rape, okay? And so these are just a few of the, the major theories that have been put forward. Okay, so one very influential thinker on this topic is Catherine McKinnon, and she built on some of the earlier work by a feminist theorist called Andrea Dworkin, which looked at um, violent pornography and violence within domestic settings, okay? And anyway, Catherine McKinnon examines the rapes in Bosnia through an analysis of um, not only violent pornography, uh, in the former Yugoslavia, but also how um, this led to a very strong culture of patriarchy. And she, it's a, there's a bit to it, this argument, but essentially she's looking at men and how they dominate women. Okay, so it's about male-female power relations. Now, without going into too much detail, essentially she looked at how uh, the former Yugoslavia was a strongly patriarchal culture and that the violence against women during the conflict was underpinned by this attitude towards women in their society. All right, so this part of the theory looks at how men dominate over women. Okay, that's one area. But there's lots of other ways to look at it too, okay? So in comparison to McKinnon, who looks at these power relations between males and females, right? People like Susan Brown Miller, they try to explain rape in conflict based on the power struggles between groups of men, right? So, and the, even though her book was published 20 years before Bosnia, it became very useful again during the Bosnian conflict. And again, so she argues, and I'll quote her, she says, Men of a conquered nation traditionally view the rape of their women as the ultimate humiliation. 
and appropriate it as part of their own male anguish of defeat. And so her arguments centre around the notion that rape during conflict functions to display and produce and maintain dominance and it's about domination by men over women but it's also symbolic domination of one group of men over another group of men and so in other words rape in war and other conflicts is a way for one group of men to construct their superior masculinity as perpetrators and also to make deprived masculinity or feminization of the defeated male enemy okay and and women's bodies become the symbolic battlefield upon which men communicate their dominance to other men okay but there's more to it than that of course ah whoops hang on there we go when comparing the theories put forward by people like McKinnon and Brown Miller and lots of others, okay, it becomes apparent that although both may discuss the ethnic dimensions as undertones present within the violence, um, neither of them really look at how um, sexual violence is an important marker for ethnic or racial or other categories, all right? So this means that, so, for example, McKinnon, because she focuses on this social dynamic between men and women, she's really, um, she's not giving much weight to how ethnicised bodies might be constructed during violence. Brown Miller, on the other hand, by focusing on the dynamics of power struggles between groups of men, fails to diminish, I um, mean, she, well, she diminishes the how women are made into the battlefield for these these fights and she kind of marginalizes the women themselves in her analysis but one theorist again just one example who attempts to construct mass rape within the paradigm of it being both uh, a mechanism of gender construction and an ethno marker right so how do you demarcate someone as being of an other ethnic group is Ronit Lenton who examines how ethnic boundaries are made and remade on women's bodies and so Lenton who uses some of these theories about the mass rapes in Bosnia she looks at like heteronationalism and so she argues that these mass rapes were about constructing a powerful Serb masculinity that was about the feminization of the rape victim, male or female. But importantly, um, she really tells us that we need to look at not one category, but multiple categories. So not just gender, but gender plus ethnicity plus other things happening. Okay, so she quotes, says, for example, that theorizing mass uh, rape involves, and I quote, constructions of gender must be intersected with racialization processes if we are to begin to understand rape as a strategy of making and remaking boundaries on women's bodies and hence to theorize women as national and ethnic subjects whose symbolic positionings mark the ever-shifting geo-conceptual boundaries of the nation. Okay, and what does that mean? Well, she's really saying yes, Mass sexual violence is about expression and gender dynamics are crucial, but so are all the other categorical differences that appear that munchul um, during conflict. And so how do these gender dynamics intersect with perceived racial or ethnic or political difference? Okay, so uh, I probably should say that a bit clearer. So like Prempuan Korban, Mangalami Kakrasan, Dan Opresi, Burlapis. So identitas gender, ras, dan berbagai kategori yang lain menyebabkan kekerasan yang juga berlapis pada perempuan. Dan kalau hanya berfokus pada satu aspek analisis saja tidak dapat menggambarkan um, kompleksitas 
complexity tells ya yeah? uh, masalah yang terjadi so jadi per, uh, pemerkosaan masal terjadi akibat kekerasan struktural terhadap misalnya kelompok minoritas etnis yang membuat posisi mereka lemah atau rentan tetapi selain itu terdapat pula ideologi gender dan budaya patriarki yang memandang perempuan sebagai simbol kehormatan dan oh, objektifikasi dari tubuh perempuan. I don't know if that makes sense, but anyway. Um, the question is, we can explain it however you like, but why do we see widespread and horrific forms of sexual violence during conflict that's that's really the question okay so let's forget about the theory for a moment and move on and look at what does this mean okay so what are the functions what are the uses of this type of violence oops okay so here i'm talking about some of the uses of this violence that's been identified okay and these relate primarily to possible symbolic and strategic uses of sexual violence okay so of course it's a tactic of war right a way for men in the process of conquering land to express their victory okay it can be a way of retaliation or vengeance or reprisal okay as the example I said before, when the Soviet Red Army troops went into Germany, they raped thousands upon thousands of German women because supposedly the German army, when they had invaded into the east, had raped thousands upon thousands of um, Russian women and women in the eastern areas. Of course, it's also a tool for propaganda. It's a very powerful tool for propaganda as there's an example there that was um, a, a US example of how the Germans were supposedly coming to attack American women, okay? Uh, it's also a way for, you know, to satisfy the troops, okay? Um, and we, again, only need to look at, for example, at the women forced into sexual slavery by the Japanese occupying army during World War II to see an example of that. And of course, the very disturbing use of rape during conflict, which has become increasingly visible in the last like 25 years, is that rape is also a, a strategy of genocide and crimes against humanity and war crimes. Um, and so this includes rape, it includes enforced prostitution, forced pregnancy, and a whole range of things as a systematic means of destroying a group. Okay, so this is about looking at sexual violence as genocide, as a form of crime against humanity, okay, and not just seeing it as part of, but, okay, we'll come back to that. And many of these theories draw upon the idea that rape is considered this ex symbolic expression, okay, and a lot of it has to do with um, when we think of a rape of a woman in the paradigm of her body and her honour being the property of her male family, right? It's not just an act of violence against her. It's also an act of violence against her family and her male relatives and her community and, and mainly the men as they fail to protect their women. And, of course, it's also about a violation of territorial integrity, okay? Again, on women's bodies. Uh, and it's about conquering the female relatives of another group of men, right? But there's, there's lots of things to look at. But what I want you to think about, though, is what does this actually look like? And why are women in particular, it happens to men and women, right? But it predominantly happens to women, attacked through their sexuality and gender. Because when you read testimonies and accounts given by those who survived these attacks or who witnessed them, in Bosnia, in Rwanda, in Congo, in Indonesia, in a very long list of incidents of mass sexual violence around the world, 
women are attacked frequently through the destruction or the, the mutilation of parts of their bodies that identify them as women. Okay, so they are raped and they have sharp objects forced into their vaginas and they have their breasts cut off and they have their genital organs mutilated and their stomachs cut open. Okay, they're all the bits that identify you as female. Okay, this happens with men too. So men's sexual organs also get removed. But this violence is extremely intimate. It's in the sense that it's about the perpetrators getting inside of and tearing off and destroying those parts of the body that identify women as women and, of course, men as men when they're desecrating men's bodies. And so I want to, I'm going to come back to that, but I want you to think about those questions in the back of your mind as we look more closely at um, sexual violence and mass atrocity. And to do this, I want to just give you one case, all right? And so it, going back to Bosnia in the 1990s to look at the Fortier case. All right, so Fucha was a, a town, all right? Um, okay, uh, it was the case in Fucha happened relatively early within the Civil War, all right? As you can see, Fucha is a city southeast of Sarajevo, which was close to the Serb border, and it was one of the first cities to be attacked in 1992. And so in April 92, Serb Bosnian Serb forces, they surround and they attack Foča and within a few days they've taken over the city, right? And so as in many parts of the Civil War, okay, uh, men were separated from women and children and the elderly and they were taken to different buildings and those buildings became concentration camps, right? And so for the women, they were kept in places where they were repeatedly raped over months, so I, to, I want to show you part of a video um, which is called I Came to Testify. That it, You can watch the whole video if you want later. It's on YouTube. It's about the story of the 16 women who survived Fortia uh, who went to the International Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in The Hague and they testified about what had happened there. And it was the first case in international law that looked at these types of sexual atrocities. So I'm going to just shop, stop sharing that screen for one second and then I'm going to share the, um, this screen here. I'm going to share it with sound. So hopefully the sound works. Okay. And just, just 10 minutes. Bisa didengarkan? The shooting started. They gathered dust in the forest, even the children and women, and then took us to a field. I saw two of my neighbors whom my sons worked with. I expected them to do something, but they didn't. Seven men, including my husband and sons, were separated from the rest. And then they told us we should start walking. When we were about 100 meters away, we heard the shots being fired. We didn't even dare to look at each other. I was lost. My children, my husband and my neighbors, 32 people were killed on that day. This was literally neighborhoods imploding, everything collapsing around you. People who yesterday were your brothers, were your closest friends, all of a sudden one morning turning into uniformed strangers. Our next door neighbor came. My father-in-law had practically raised him. He wasn't some stranger. He had a million cups of coffee and lunches at my father-in-law's. He came to the door and kicked the door in. He was armed to the teeth. 
He gathered all of us into the kitchen, and then he took a knife and cut off my clothes. He raped me and beat me in front of my father-in-law and mother-in-law. When he finished molesting me, he loaded a bullet in the chamber of his gun and shot my father-in-law, killing him instantly. Then he killed my mother-in-law. He had a gun in one hand and he was holding me by the hair in the other. He turned around to shoot at my sister-in-law. I gathered my courage. I suppose that's what God wanted. I took advantage of his lack of attention and, thank God, I struggled out of his grasp and escaped. I hid in a pumpkin patch that was 60 feet from the house. He couldn't find me, so he set fire to the house. I was 60 feet away and I saw everything. Z.R. trekked through the forest for days, scared and hungry, the fate of her imprisoned husband unknown. She evaded the Serb army and gangs of paramilitary forces and eventually found her way out of the country to the relative safety of a refugee camp. For Witness 99 and hundreds of other women trapped in Foča, the nightmare would continue. While their sons and husbands were being beaten, starved, and executed in concentration camps, the women of Foča were locked in hotels, schools, private homes, and makeshift prisons around the city. They said we should get ready. There was a truck waiting in front of the school. They didn't tell us where we are going and we didn't ask. We couldn't say anything. They took us up to the last classroom on the first floor. They took us to a sports hall. They would come and curse us, tell us that we Muslims were getting what we deserved. There were about 30 or 40 of us. There were 72 of us there. Women and children. After they gathered us, the raping started. The report for the United Nations today confirms that rape has been used on a deliberate, horrifying scale in the civil war in Bosnia. The international community estimates that Serbs may have systematically raped as many as 20,000 Muslim women as a weapon of war. This woman is one of a number we spoke to from different towns in Bosnia who told us that Serbs had set up brothels in their towns. Younger women were kept there and raped repeatedly. Stories like these have been filtering out for more than six months now as the world stood silently by. That dismissive attitude that rape is always a byproduct of war and the shrug that goes along with it is the very attitude that we're here to protest and to draw attention to. The systematic, sadistic sexual violence against the Muslim women has been known for months and months and months and the international community and the, the uh, powers that be have done nothing to stop it. Rape has always been an undercurrent of war. People talk about um, raping and pillaging, um, and it just becomes a phrase that people don't think about. They just think it's an attack on the civilian population, raping and pillaging. This is the building in Nuremberg, where 20 top Nazis are being tried for many crimes. The wrongs which we seek to condemn... I had heard that in Nuremberg, there was a discussion about whether to bring up the subject of rape because a lot of rapes had occurred during and after the war. And somebody made a comment, we don't want a bunch of crying women in the courtroom. If you look at the pictures of Nuremberg, it's mostly men, the defendants, the judges, the prosecutors, the defense lawyers. In that environment, women aren't given a place at the table, even as a witness in many cases. In the maybe 50 years since Nuremberg, a lot of things have changed. There are more women in the profession, prosecutors, judges, people who are dealing with the witnesses and saying, this is an important issue, we should talk about it. It's worth talking about, and it's worth getting it out there. So at least, even if we're not prosecuting every single rape that occurs, that we are acknowledging that this is what's happening and women's experience during wartime. In December of 1995, the warring parties in Bosnia came to Paris to sign an American brokered deal that put an end to three and a half years of fighting. 
in the aftermath, details of atrocities in places like Priedor, Visegrad, and Srebrenica came into gruesome focus. And Focha, which had been sealed off from the tribunal investigators behind the wall of war, finally became a reality as they made their way through the ravaged city. It's like stepping into a painting that you've heard about, but you actually start walking in that painting. What they found was a fractured, inhospitable place. Half its residents, some 20,000 Muslims, were simply gone. All 14 of their mosques reduced to rubble. They even tried to erase the name by calling the town Serbinia, meaning place of the Serbs. Under the protection of UN forces, the investigators documented the places they had heard about in the testimony of survivors. Bukbiela, Miljeniva Hotel, Jaga's House, Klantfas, Partizan. Now, crime scenes. The physical evidence they collected in Focha convinced the team that they could build a case to prove that an organized campaign of rape had indeed been used as an instrument of terror. It has a huge impact on the entire family and the entire community. If people hear of rapes in the neighbor village, they, they flee. The rapes were used for not only the immediate impact that they had on women, but the long-term destruction of, of the soul of the community. I'll stop it there. Um, oops, sorry. I'm just going to go back. Oops. Sorry. Second half here. Oh. Oops. One second. Okay, can you see the PowerPoint? Yeah. Sorry, can someone just confirm that we can see the PowerPoint? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it okay. is already there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, as I said, you can go and watch the rest of the film if you like, the, it's on YouTube. Um, and so the reason I showed you that one was because it's the first case in history uh, that's prosecuted where sexual assaults uh, are taken seriously in international law. Uh, and it's that particular film is the story of some of the women who testified before that tribunal. And so uh, the trial officially began in uh, March 2000 and they had three defendants and um, the, the film goes through some of the problems that the trial faced and um, finally the conviction of the three of the defendants, Kunara, Kovac and Borkovic, uh, and they were sentenced for between 28 years and 12 years imprisonment. Um, yeah, so if you're interested in the international law side of it, I would recommend that you go and watch the rest of that film. So after looking at the Forcher case, though, um, I want to recap a, a couple of things before I go on um, to talk about Rwanda and Indonesia as well. And that is that international criminal law on prosecuting sexualized forms of violence has come a long way in the last 20 years. So we've gone from sexually based crimes being naturalised and mostly ignored right up until the 1990s through now to rape and other forms of sexualised violence being codified specifically in international law, like at the International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda um, and within the Rome Statute for the ICC. However, um, there's still a very long way to go now, if you're interested in this particular area of international criminal jurisprudence, 
there's a few other key cases that I would point you to. The Akiyesu case before the Rwanda Tribunal. It's the first um, charge of rape as an act of genocide. Okay. The um, Later on after that, the Gachimbitsi trial is another one. The Celebici case, based on the Celebici um, concentration camp, also tried before the Yugoslavia Tribunal. It was looking at um, rape as a particular form of war crime in terms of its breach of the Geneva Conventions, a significant area of jurisprudence development there. Um, in particular, um, of course, there's not just the international tribunals, there's also the various hybrid tribunals in different parts of the world, like the Special Court for Sierra Leone, which is a hybrid trial. Um, what's interesting there is a number of the cases that they have tried on sexual enslavement and forced marriage uh, as crimes against humanity. Um, very um, significant developments from that tribunal. But that's, that's just one example, okay? Um, and so all of that kind of sets the scene. And I'm not going to go into, into too much detail. Um, so I don't have time. But I just want to talk a little bit about this book that I'm writing with my colleague, Dr. Aaron Jesse, in which we're comparing cases of what we call symbolic violence in three periods of genocidal periods, okay? Uh, so this is Rwanda in 1994, in Bosnia in the 1990s, and in Indonesia in 1965. And so for those less familiar with these contexts, uh, the other two uh, are the genocide in Rwanda in 1994, in which an estimated 800,000 people, most of whom were Tutsi, but also some ethnically Hutu moderates, were killed in just a few months. The genocide was very quick in that sense. It only took a few months. And of course, in the Indonesian case, there's an estimated 500,000 to 1 people, million people killed between 1965 and 1966, most of them because of their association with the Indonesian Communist Party. Now, my colleague Erin is an oral historian as well, who's interviewed um, lots of people in Rwanda and Bosnia. Uh, and I'm an old historian as well, and I've mostly interviewed people from the Indonesian case, uh, including in Sumatra. And so our book compares a number of different types of symbolic violence. Um, so when I say symbolic violence, I often, I mean like spectacular forms of uh, killings, okay, but also mutilation and things like that. Uh, but one of the key areas is um, on gendered forms of symbolic violence. It takes up a fair part of the book. And so broadly speaking, uh, these include atrocities like mass rape, but also things like forced incest, forced maternity, forced abortion, uh, as well as forms of mutilation that target men's and women's uh, reproductive functions, including evisceration and castration, um, breast removal, things like that. Okay, uh, but it also includes cases that are less overtly violent, but are nonetheless still symbolic violence. And so, a lot of this involves uh, shaming and humiliation that plays upon local gender norms. Okay, um, in most of the accounts that we look at, adult women and teenage girls were overwhelmingly the, the victims of this violence, and the perpetrators are mostly adult men. But for female and male victims, though, the harm that perpetrators are inflicting on their victims in these stories, it shows how um, symbolic violence is used by perpetrators during genocide in deliberately sexualized and gendered ways. Okay, so one consequence of the often spectacular nature of these sexual and gendered atrocities, which is a fundamental part of perpetrators' intent 
to inflict trauma and horror on the victims but also their communities is that these stories about these terrible acts they circulate widely within communities okay so when we read accounts of genocidal violence anywhere in the world really these are the types of stories that get told and retold uh, and because you any account of any genocide um, is going there's going to be accounts involving widespread race rape and particular forms of violence against pregnant women that's one example that is very common and similarly accounts describing uh, particular body parts and then display of particular body parts they come up again and again in narratives by survivors and witnesses of genocide okay um, anyway um, I won't go any more there our analysis looks at you know highlights how gender and sexual based violence is used particularly but not exclusively against women during periods of genocide um, but it does show how you know this is one form that affects women as women more than men as men okay um, and these analyses uh, are also informed by again quite a bit of theory around why this kind of violence happens and I'll give you one example um, one theorist uh, Eliza von Jordan Froelich she talks about life force atrocities okay that's what she calls them um, and so she thinks them as being um, includes things like sexualized forms of mutilation and gendered forms of destruction that are characteristic of genocidal violence across many different times and periods and so she calls them um, these life force atrocities which she defines in as she says there in the quote um, those that target the life force of the group by destroying both the physical symbols of its life force as well as its most basic institutions of reproduction, especially the family unit. So this means you attack mothers and their children and you do things to women and children and men that is particularly terrible for the community. Anyway, so in the book, um, Again, I'm not going to give you exact details, uh, but we look at these cases from oral histories, uh, from people who we interview uh, from Rwanda, Indonesia and Bosnia. Okay, and we divided it into three main types of sexualized violence. Okay, and these were about uh, mass rape and sexual assaults and then particular types of sexualized mutilation and then finally gendered humiliation and I'm not going to read out any examples because they're very graphic and they're very upsetting and they depict terrible acts of violence. Now I, I think I mean you understand what I mean when I'm talking about mass rapes and sexual mutilation. Um, I don't think I need to give you any examples there but the humiliation cases may not always be so clear. All right, and so let me just give you one type of gendered humiliation from the Indonesian case, right? Which was about head shaving. What's that word? Gundul? I don't know. Uh, for women victims. And so stories about women who are suspected communists having their head shaved, mostly while they're in detention, is something that is seen across Indonesia. Okay, so there's stories about this from Aceh and the rest of Sumatra, in Java, in Bali, um, many in, in Maluku, in lots of different islands, and it's all the way across to like Pulau Alor in NTT, right? So the whole spread. Um, in survivor stories, head shaving often happened at the same time as other forms of sexual assault. And so women describe being uh, raped in detention, and then they have their head shaved or their hair cut off. And women explain that having their hair cut off was a way to shame them and to show, you know, other people that they were bad women, right? Now, of course, 
hair shaving to humiliate or to control people. It's not, it's nothing new, okay? Hair shaving um, at other points in Indonesian history has had many meanings, okay? It's not just about humiliation. There's lots of other uses of hair removal, okay? But when we look at it as a form of punishment, okay, there's other nearby examples like in World War II. There's uh, examples from um, prison camps in World War II. Um, in contemporary Indonesia, Anak uh, Jalanan, so street kids, they talk about when they uh, get, like, be dunk up by Polisi, they get um, head shaved as a way to show that they are Anak Jalanan, right, and a, as a way to humiliate them as well. Um, there's other stories in contemporary Aceh, right, where women have their head shaved if they're caught not obeying, you know, religious laws, right? And so hair shaving isn't new, okay? But in the stories about 1965 in Indonesia, head shaving is done almost always to younger women who are also sexually assaulted. Why? Because these idealised constructions of young female sexuality Okay, all sexuality, are always signaled through physical markers in some way. Okay, so like hair length, you know, how you dress, how you behave, okay, other ideas of what um, that regulate what a young, desirable female should do and how she should look. Okay. Um, and just like in every like many parts of the world, okay, when we think about the social and cultural dynamics that govern what a young female body should look like, okay, how she's constructed as desirable, it's linked to having long hair, right? So forcible hair removal in 1965, yes, it's about harming and humiliating communists, but it's also about the age and the gender of the victims. And so hair removal as an act of shaming has to be seen as a gendered act, okay, because it's about using it against young women and it's sexual, okay, because it's about playing upon constructions of what young female sexuality looks like, okay. Why? Because by altering, by changing what a young woman should look like, right, and then sometimes forcing these women once their heads have been shaved to walk outside in front of the, you know, the codim or whatever, uh, perpetrators deliberately manipulated those gender constructions and they created an effective weapon which used concepts of shame and honour and sexuality that attach to young women's bodies. Okay, so that, that's just one example of what we're looking at in the book. Um, and goodness me, I think I have spoken for a very long time, so I think I had better stop very soon. But I just will uh, finish by saying that um, sekali lagi saya ingin mengucapkan terima kasih kepada Dr. Yeni Nani dan <laughs> Dr. Dia uh, dan Universitas Mandalas atas undangan um, datang hari ini dan bicara sama anda sekalian tentang penelitian saya dan mohon maaf atas kekurangannya dan ya yeah, terima kasih terima kasih Ani uh, very interesting uh, presentation I mean that's really really interesting topic I mean um, ya yeah, saya mau uh, kasih kesimpulan dulu sebelum kita bertanya jawab uh, dengan uh, para hadirin yang ada bergabung di sini. So, uh, pertama saya mau menyimpulkan sedikit secara ringkas sebelum saya juga ingin mengulas apa yang sudah uh, Ibu Ani sampaikan. Jadi Ibu Ani uh, berbicara tentang tiga uh, negara yang menjadi pokok bahasan dalam buku uh, Ibu Ani, yaitu uh, negara Rwanda, uh, Bosnia, dan Indonesia. Uh, Ibu Ani berangkat dari uh, topik uh, pembunuhan massal ya, atau kekerasan massal yang uh, terjadi di tiga negara ini. Uh, pembunuhan massal ini uh, mencakup di sana ada 
kekerasan seksual yaitu uh, perkosaan uh, kemudian itu dilakukan dalam uh, upaya uh, untuk menjadikan kekerasan seksual atau uh, pemerkosaan itu sebagai uh, alat uh, uh, alat perang ya untuk menghancurkan uh, musuh ya uh, tapi dari dalam satu hal juga kekerasan terjadi dengan uh, menghancurkan satu kelompok etnik Uh, grup tertentu ya seperti yang terjadi uh, di Bosnia jadi kelompok uh, Muslim itu perempuannya disiksa diperkosa dan uh, setelah laki-laki dan perempuan dipisahkan uh, yang laki-laki dan anak laki-laki itu biasanya ditembak sementara yang perempuan uh, itu dipisahkan kemudian mereka angkut kepada apa dibawa kepada uh, ke satu tempat di beberapa misalnya sekolah-sekolah yang sudah ditinggalkan gedung dan hotel uh, di mana mereka juga di sana ya uh, akan mengalami uh, kejadian yang uh, membawa trauma yang panjang kepada perempuan uh, karena di sana mereka mengalami uh, bentuk-bentuk kekerasan uh, yang berkelanjutan dari uh, orang-orang yang uh, menjadikan itu sebagai suatu Uh, apa namanya uh, yang kejahatan yang terstruktur ya karena itu dari sistem uh, perang ya untuk menghancurkan satu kelompok etnik tertentu uh, di dalam uh, di dalam kamp-kamp uh, konsentrasi di mana perempuan itu di uh, dikurung ya uh, pemerkosaan itu uh, menurut uh, uh, Ani uh, seperti yang terjadi di Bosnia itu sebenarnya sudah terjadi juga pada zaman uh, Nazi dulu uh, dan juga terjadi di Indonesia uh, sudah ke batu zaman uh, komunis ya 1965 di mana perempuan-perempuan yang dianggap uh, masuk dalam kelompok komunis uh, itu mereka dihancurkan uh, harga dirinya jadi di sini Bu Ani lebih memfokuskan kepada teori feminis ya uh, women's body ya digunakan uh, tubuh perempuan itu dijadikan uh, alat untuk sebagai Uh, me, apa ya, meng, men, apa, suatu alat untuk perang sebagai senjata perang tapi juga uh, menghancurkan harga diri perempuan dan laki-laki dari pihak uh, perempuan yang uh, dihancurkan tadi jadi di sini uh, tidak hanya dari segi uh, perang tapi juga dilihat dari peranan laki-laki sebagai uh, menonjolkan masculinitynya dari sebagai Uh, kelompok uh, patriarki yang mendominasi tubuh perempuan di mana um, perempuan itu uh, tubuh perempuan dijadikan alat simbolis sebagai medan perangnya uh, musuh ya uh, kemudian uh, um, nah perempuan ini menurut ibu ani mengalami uh, kekerasan yang berlapis ya uh, selain mereka mengalami perkosaan di sana juga terjadi ada uh, uh, apa, penanaman ideologi gender yang dimanfaatkan yang kalau menurut teori yang tadi Ibu Ani sampaikan dari beberapa uh, teori uh, yang ada ya kemudian uh, Ibu Ani juga menyampaikan ap- apa manfaat dari apa kekerasan yang dialami apa pemberian kekerasan atau melakukan kekerasan terhadap perempuan tersebut ya itu merupakan taktik perang ya kemudian retaliasi dari uh, suatu uh, ethnic group kemudian alat propaganda kemudian uh, strategi untuk menghab- menghapuskan satu kelompok ethnic tertentu ya kemudian juga uh, menjadikan uh, padahal sebenarnya kejahatan itu merupakan yang sudah kita pahami itu merupakan kejahatan terhadap uh, hak asasi manusia baik itu laki-laki dan perempuan tetapi Uh, yang kita lihat, uh, Ibu Ani juga menyampaikan tadi bahwa sebenarnya kejahatan terhadap perempuan itu sudah lama berulang kali dilakukan, tapi ini harus menjadi perhatian para akademisi untuk dipelajari dan baik itu dari uh, kalau Ibu Ani mewawancarai ya berdasarkan hasil wawancara, tapi bisa juga tadi ada teori yang uh, berangkat dari foto-foto perang dari korban-korban uh, yang sudah pernah di apa di export di, di ditampilkan foto-fotonya. Uh, jadi uh, saya pikir itu kesimpulan. Tapi saya ingin bertanya dulu kepada Ibu Ani uh, yang berkaitan dengan um, um, di Indonesia ya uh, 
tentang pemotongan rambut yang digunakan untuk uh, mempermalukan perempuan. Karena rambut, keindahan rambut, rambut yang panjang itu merupakan uh, harga diri. ya Misalnya harga diri perempuan, kecantikan perempuan, harga diri sebagai uh, dari kelompok patriarki bahwa perempuan itu harus berambut panjang. Nah, kalau sudah perempuan dicukur rambutnya atau dibotak atau kemudian dicukur dengan uh, sembarangan atau semrawut atau biasanya dicukur ya Bu Ani ya. Nah, apakah itu bu, uh, bukannya kalau kita lihat dari segi feminis uh, modern itu sebenarnya seharusnya perempuan tidak merasa dipermalukan. So, do you think like shaving the hair of the woman like uh, from the perspective of the feminist is like shaming the woman's body or the image of the woman. Thank you Silakan, very much. Ibani. Yeah. Terima kasih, um, <laughs> Budia. Um, thank you too for that um, very good uh, summary. Um, mm -hmm. I was I was nodding while you were while you were speaking. Maaf, saya tidak bisa menjelaskan semua yang dalam bahasa Indonesia. So, if it's okay, can I answer in English? Yeah, sure. I will translate that right, into okay. the audience. Yeah, please. Maaf. <laughs> yeah. Um, of course. Uh, there's nothing wrong with hair shaving mm -hmm. by itself, of course, right? Um, just like anything you choose to do to your body yourself with your own consent is, is your business. And in some ways for many women, not um, confining yourself to ideas of what is feminine and what is desirable can be very empowering okay so um the the lesbian feminist movement of the 1970s in particular um rejected a lot of ideas of what were traditional feminine ideas of beauty all right so that, that that's one thing right yeah. however <laughs> Um, in the context, context means everything, right? So mm -hmm. in 1965, this was a deliberate tool mm -hmm. that was used by perpetrators to, as a way to harm their victims. Mm -hmm. So most of these stories are about young women. Many of them are, you know, Masi Prawan, right? Mm -hmm. Bulumanika. And so they are raped and then they have their heads shaped. Mm -hmm. And it's a way to show that they are, you know, they're no longer pure, they're no longer desirable mm -hmm. as um, marriageable women, okay, because they are, you know, they've um, been raped and therefore they are in you know. Yeah. And so it's, it's a physical marker for shaming them okay. and that is bad <laughs> yeah oke okay. terima, uh, terima kasih Ibu Ani jadi saya bertanya apakah karena berkaitan dengan teori feminis dengan memotong rambut perempuan uh, yang dianggap uh, masuk dalam kelompok uh, grup uh, komunis tadi merupakan uh, suatu penghilangan identitas perempuan uh, karena dianggap sudah menurut tapi Ibu Ani mengatakan di sini memotong rambut atau mengundulkan rambut secara prinsipnya atau kalau kita lihat dari uh, minis liberal itu tidak ada masalah uh, tapi pada masa itu uh, pemotongan rambut perempuan itu dilakukan biasanya setelah mereka diperkosa uh, dan biasanya itu terjadi kepada anak-anak muda setelah mereka diperkosa berarti mereka tidak perawan lagi ya tidak murni lagi Kemudian kalau rambutnya sudah dipotong, mereka uh, menjadi uh, perempuan yang sudah tidak diinginkan karena pertama sudah diperkosa, kemudian mereka sudah uh, uh, tidak punya rambut, tidak punya keindahan lagi, ya. Jadi itu merupakan alat untuk uh, apa? Uh, yang menunjukkan bahwa uh, mereka, sebagai tanda bahwa perempuan tersebut sudah uh, diperkosa dan mereka sudah tidak murni dan uh, tidak seharusnya. Uh, diinginkan lagi. Uh, sebelum kita masuk, saya juga ada apa, satu. Saya, uh, saya sudah menonton ya film banyak tentang karena saya tertarik dengan kekerasan perempuan di Rwanda, uh, di um, Bosnia, uh, film-film perang itu. Nah, satu pertanyaan, uh, apakah dari uh, apa, studi Ibu Ani selama ini ada 
satu organisasi yang membela uh, hak-hak uh, perempuan yang sudah mengalami uh, kekerasan uh, fisik, ya, khususnya yang berkaitan dengan uh, perkosaan tersebut dan juga uh, mutilasi. Uh, apakah ada organisasi sosial di dunia? Ya, kita bicara seperti yang di Den Haag, uh, itu biasanya yang apa? Apakah itu juga menjadi bagian uh, apa ya? Uh, sudah satu dalam organisasi internasional. Silakan. Thank you very much, uh, Budia. Um, actually, this might be a question that my I see my friend Nukila Avanti is is here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, she she works on this. Uh -huh, that was uh, interesting. Uh, well, okay. Internationally, no, there's no one organization that deals with all of the many many. Um, consequences of mass sexual violence of course there are many advocate organization like UN women unifem yeah. things like that yes they are but in each local context um it really depends like in Indonesia there's no one single body um, that deals with yeah. yeah I mean there's you know Komnas Prempuan there are individual um health and support units and things like that. Just like in Rwanda, there are particular organisations, some of them government, some of them NGOs that support women and families uh, in, in many different ways. Yeah. Um, uh, but, I mean, uh, because women to, okay, in the aftermath of these types of terrible events, of course, there's many, many things that need to happen and the support that communities need is multiple forms of that. And it is about personal um, health and recovery and it's also about community recovery and societal recovery <laughs> and all of yeah. these things are, are complex. So... Honestly, I, I, I'm not an expert in... Um, right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. I didn't like go into detail for the question because uh, I think it's better to hear the question from all the uh, our participants uh, today. Uh, I'm, like, I'm very excited to see what kind of question that uh, we are having. Uh, saya, okay, Agu Ani bisa lihat ya. Pertanyaan yang pertama ini tolong slide-nya ditampilkan dari yang pertama. Apakah ini yang pertama? Oke, okay. uh, oke, okay. Ibu Ani bisa lihat? Yes, yes. Yeah, oke. Okay. Uh, that's in English. <laughs> in practice, addressing gender-based violence and mass sexual violence in communities of the violence. What the term actually means is the definition serve the needs, interests, and rights of diverse groups affected by different forms of gender and sexualized violence from mm -hmm. Nukila Evanti. Thank you, Nikila. Um, I should say, Nikila and I uh, have written together in the past. <laughs> uh, so, hello, Nikila. Thank you for that question. Uh, I think no is the short answer, <laughs> um, unfortunately. Um, to be honest, um, that's a really big question. Um, Honestly, I think no matter where you are in the world, it doesn't matter what sort of society you have or what sort of laws are in place or not, everyone knows that this kind of violence is wrong and everyone understands that this kind of violence violates community and taboos and ideas of the family and what is respect. And so... At the end of the day, everyone knows is how it's wrong, but no one really knows how to stop it. Um, I wish it was, I mean, for me, it's about accountability and everyone who does this goes to jail. But sadly, uh, I mean, I, I don't have the exact rates, but the number of people who are actually prosecuted for this kind of violence during wartime is a teeny, teeny, tiny, tiny, tiny fraction. <laughs> of, <laughs> yeah, like it's something like 0.0001% of 
of mm. estimated cases. So in, in like tribunals, I mean. Uh, so, I, yeah, the short answer is no. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Tidak, ya? Tidak ada. <laughs> okay, terima kasih, Bu Ani. Uh, kita masuk ke pertanyaan kedua. Uh, Assalamualaikum. Uh, bagaimana mengakhiri kekerasan? How can we end the violence toward, uh, against women? And what kind, uh, what are the challenges, you know, that we are facing uh, to do that? Oh, another really, really big question. Uh, <laughs> for me, uh, part of the answer to that is about dealing with gender inequality. So... It's the word Satara, Kastara ungender. Yeah, Kastara you know, ungender. Because essentially, and, and if in, because how men and women interact during peacetime really does influence how they treat each other during wartime. And so when conflicts happen, um, lots of violence happens that would not normally happen. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I believe there is a strong link between peacetime gender inequality and wartime uh, extreme forms of gendered violence. And so for me, it's about women having equal participation and uh, equality before the law, but not just before the law, socially, economically, politically, all of these things. And not just, you know, women in parliament and, you know, mm -hmm. women can can get a divorce. I mean, full equality in every way. So, yeah, yeah. That's, that's me. Will, but, uh, uh, yeah, thank you. I will translate a little bit. Jadi menurut Ibu Ani, uh, upaya dalam untuk melakukan itu hanya uh, bisa terjadi kalau uh, adanya kesetaraan gender di mana uh, itu muncul pada masa damai sekarang. Jadi kalau ada uh, kesetaraan gender di dalam masa damai, uh, it, ketika ada perang dan uh, muncul kejahatan-kejahatan yang ekstrim uh, terhadap uh, uh, perempuan, itu uh, mungkin ya di, di, dibenahi dari keterlibatan perempuan di uh, uh, bidang hukum, sosial, ekonomi, dan lain-lainnya. Oke, okay, kita masuk ke pertanyaan berikutnya. Oh, ini dari Deci. Uh, apa saja cara-cara mendasar bagi? Uh, how can we? Uh, what are the basic uh, protection that we can do to protect ourselves from the violence or the uh, humiliations and or into in the mass uh, context? Okay. Well, wow, these, these are some these are some really difficult questions. <laughs> Oh, but but thank you very much, Deji, um, and thank you too to Nurul before. Um, I think when we talk about preventing violence against women, we need to shift our conversation away from the responsibility of the individual, the victim, um, and making it much more about the responsibility of the society, and in particular enforcing accountability for perpetrators so that the consequences for perpetrating become so tremendous that it's a deterrent. So I, if, if we look at different theories of law and order, and there's lots of different theories around how hukum works in a society, I personally am at the very strong accountability end. Um, which doesn't mean send everybody to jail. It means normalising accountability for bad behaviour rather than saying to the victim, you should do this so that you prevent becoming a victim. You know, so women don't wear tight clothes. Women don't go out at night. Women, you should stay home and be protected by your men because... That's not the answer. The answer is the men need to be accountable for their behaviour. Okay, saya uh, simpulkan. Uh, jadi bukan bagaimana perempuan men, me, 
melindungi dirinya bagai, dengan uh, dilarang keluar malam atau mem, tidak memakai baju atau pakaian uh, yang tertentu, tapi lebih kepada uh, bagaimana laki-laki uh, menormalkan, uh, membuatnya sesuatu yang uh, menghargai ya perempuan uh, apa adanya, bukan karena perempuannya yang dilarang memakai baju tertentu atau keluar. Jadi lebih kepada menormalisasikan hubungan antara laki-laki dan perempuan dalam kesetaraan itu. Oke, okay, terima kasih. Lanjutnya kita masuk ke pertanyaan. Uh, Oke, okay, this is in English. Um, now, we do understand the violence on women, particularly in concrete time. In our sequel, Afridi had been ruined by the structure of ideas itself. How domination ideas is come out as a ruler of our societies? I mean, in values of tradition, politics, and social relationship, or more than we live in sin structure, and its gang is one of the die hard that we cannot change it today. What can we do to, uh, to get the solution, the, the brain sick? <laughs> um, yeah, that we have today. So this is really also a very difficult question, Annie. <laughs> Uh, I think there's probably a comment that the, that the world has got lots of problems, and, and I agree. Yeah. Yeah. The current problem, yeah? <laughs> yeah, there's lots of problems, yeah. And resist fascism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't really have an answer apart from Yeah, resist. that is really like, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, Annie. Let's we go to the next one. Um, Oke, okay. saya hadiah tuh Fadila uh, bertanya kenapa, kenapa kenapa dalam wanita atau khusus pada rumah tangga sering dia melakukan ada apa yang membuat orang ibu rumah tangga? Oke, okay. uh, this is uh, a little bit more into the current situation. Um, what make women as a housewife uh, they are silent or they are not doing anything? Uh, towards uh, the suffering that they have experienced so far? That's a very good question. Um, thank you, Hariaku. Um, I think there's lots of reasons for, I'm guessing that you mean like women experiencing abuse in yeah. domestic in violence. The, yeah. yeah, yeah, within the Rumatanga. Um, I think there's a very nice RUU anti kekerasan terhadap perempuan that should be passed by your legislature with all haste. I believe that the anti violence against women bill has been sitting in the uh, legislation process for a long time now and it should be passed because it would improve some of the very basic structures to enable women to have equal access to redress within the court system in Indonesia, which they currently don't have. So yeah. that would be one thing that could be yeah. done that would okay. make a real difference. Adia tu kata Ibu Ani, ya itu tergantung kepada, sebenarnya sudah ada ya rancangan undang-undang uh, terhadap kekerasan uh, pada perempuan, tapi itu sudah lama didiamkan saja, belum di ya diluncurkan uh, sebagai uh, hasil dari kerja orang di <laughs> legislatif ya untuk uh, segera uh, mer uh, meluncurkan atau mensahkan undang-undang perasaan perempuan tersebut. Oke, okay, selanjutnya. Uh, Midawati, saya melihat patriarki adalah sumber masalah. So, uh, it, uh, in my opinion, that patriarchal norms are the source of this violence uh, against women. Um, so what is we see the, the war crime? Uh, pendekatan World CD, uh, WCD karena tidak semua. So not all the uh, cultures are patriarchal. So uh, what about the Minangkabau uh, matrilineal uh, women here? Mm. That's a great question. Uh, absolutely correct. Um, Minangkabau culture is matrilineal, uh, which is awesome. And the answer is always smash the patriarchy, right? That's always the answer. <laughs> uh, I Okay, 
I am not an expert on Minangkabau matrilineal cultures. Um, Evelyn Blackburn, I have looked at some of her writing, and I have to say uh, my good colleague Yeni Nani and I have worked together for mm -hmm. a very long time, and she is always explaining to me how things work in Minangkabau society, and it's always really um, enlightening for me. How, do I think Minangkabau society is completely free of patriarchy, though? No. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> uh, and so the answer is always smash the patriarchy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kembali kepada kelompok patriarkal juga, ya? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, when women rule the world, I think things will be much yeah. better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ya, yeah, uh, ya yeah, Pak Ibu Mida saya pikir uh, mengerti jawapan Ibu Ani. Uh, walaupun Minangkabau matrilineal, tapi ketika uh, PRRI ya terang waktu zaman uh, Civil War juga perempuan Minang mengalami uh, kekerasan uh, seksual ya, ada yang diperkosa dan ya yeah, um, Ibu saya juga mengalami yang seperti itu. <laughs> Because she, she was during uh, the Civil War. <laughs> Oke, okay, bagaimana relasi kekuasaan? What is the relation uh, between power and uh, the unequal uh, power uh, that can uh, yeah, cause uh, violence uh, based on gender? Yeah, I, I think I 100% agree um, that there is an extremely strong causal link between uh, inequality between genders and how this causes uh, gender-based violence during peacetime and during wartime. So uh, I guess when we talk about norms and what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, how can you behave in a society uh, and how can't you behave and you receive a sanction, A lot of that has to do with are you a man or are you a woman? And in most societies, I think, uh, the way that we think about what's okay for men to treat women um, enables violence in many different ways. It's not just sexual violence. It's economic violence and other forms of structural violence, like we would talk about if we were thinking of Dalton. But to be honest, uh, to me, inequality of the genders is the is the the akar mm. of all violence. <laughs> But <laughs> yeah, because I think um, if we can't treat like if, if you treat people as unequal to you, it's easier to commit violence against them. I don't know. Ya, saya uh, terjemahkan. Jadi menurut Ibu Ani, um, semuanya itu berakar dari ketidaksetaraan gender. Jadi kalau laki-laki uh, bisa menghormati atau memperlakukan perempuan dengan uh, apa? Dengan adil dan itu uh, pasti bisa mereka menghindarkan diri untuk melakukan kejahatan terhadap perempuan ya. Jadi ke kejahatan perempuan itu tidak hanya dalam bentuk ke 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 kekerasan dalam bentuk kejahatan seks tapi juga bisa dalam kejahatan dalam uh, di bidang ekonomi ya kalau mereka misalnya tidak dibayar uh, setara dengan laki-laki atau mereka diperlakukan lebih uh, apa tidak apa tidak sopan tidak apa dilakukan dengan kasar kalau di bidang pekerjaan ya misalnya di pabrik atau di ya di mana saja perempuan bekerja oke selanjutnya uh, ini dari Rahmat ini bertanya bagaimana nasib sebagian besar perempuan jadi so what uh, what happened to the women who have experienced those uh, sexual violence during the war uh, did they get or I mean, could they like overcome their, uh, you know, trauma and live uh, as before, or vice versa? Uh, thank you, Rafa. That's a really important question because I think the trauma of war continues for the rest of somebody's life. I don't think you ever really 
reconcile or ever really heal from these things um, for men or women. Uh, but for women in particular who are victims of sexual violence during war, they have some additional burdens. And some of those burdens are immediate, short-term ones, and others are medium and long-term burdens. And they're not just about health and personal trauma. They're about long-term economic survival. Because if a woman is raped and she is abandoned by her family or abandoned by her community because of the stigma of uh, being a rape victim, she's more vulnerable in many different ways. So, I mean, for the, the women who whose stories... Um, I've been told for women who survived this kind of violence, many of them are incredibly resilient. They had to be resilient because they had to survive. And many of them had to survive in order to look after their children as well. And so a lot of these women tell amazing stories where they have overcome so many challenges, including stigma, uh, in order to rebuild their lives after this kind of violence and honestly it's very um it's very humbling to to hear these stories because i i have great admiration for um women who are able to overcome these these terrible things okay saya terima kan um jadi kata ibu ani uh, memang perempuan-perempuan yang sudah mengalami um uh, kekerasan atau masa yang apa ya membuat mereka trauma uh, sebagian dari mereka juga ditinggalkan oleh uh, kelompok uh, masyarakat mereka karena dianggap ya sudah uh, tercemar karena sudah diperkosa tetapi banyak dari perempuan-perempuan tersebut juga uh, meng, uh, berhasil um, uh, keluar atau menghadapi berhasil menghadapi tantangan-tantangan dan stigma yang sudah tercoreng atau menjadi stigma yang mereka harus bawa karena mereka punya anak dan mereka harus berjuang untuk bertahan hidup dan menyelesaikan masalah yang mereka hadapi demi keluarga mereka. Ya, oke okay, kita lanjutkan. Ini dari Sylvia. So why the violence? Why does the violence to men? It's very difficult to erase or to eradicate, and siapa, who who is supposed to be responsible uh, in the case of violence towards women in a country? Um, that's also a very good question. Um, yeah. I should also say too that. Um, uh, my good friend Yeninani is also the person who you should talk to about resilience. Uh, she has written quite a bit about women's resilience in the face of overcoming conflict. So I'll tell uh, Yeninani to respond <laughs> to that one too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ibu But, Upi, <laughs> kata Ibu Ani ini bagian dari Ibu Upi sebenarnya ini uh, yang pernah dilakukan penelitian Ibu Upi sebenarnya ya, tentang resilience ya perempuan ini yang menghadapi kekerasan. Iya <laughs> yeah, benar. Itu, sebet <laughs> itu sebetulnya kerja kami kerja kita bersama termasuk dengan Pak Pak Yudi Andoni uh, bagaimana. Uh, perempuan-perempuan yang mengalami kekerasan akibat perang dan bagaimana mereka orang-orang eh, kemudian para korban kemudian eh, mampu untuk eh, bertahan hidup kemudian pelan-pelan keluar dari trauma atau tidak sama sekali jadi eh, eh, yang kita pikir pada saat itu adalah bahwa eh, setelah kekerasan terjadi maka kita selalu memandang eh, oh, perempuan adalah objek artinya mereka menjadi korban terus menerus jadi bagaimana cara mereka ketika mereka mendapatkan tindak kekerasan jelas mereka menjadi korban dan pada sisi sejarah kejadian itu sudah lama terjadi namun mereka itu orang bukan benda 
Artinya eh, situasi berubah, environment berubah. Kemudian ada hal-hal yang kemudian membuat mereka eh, eh, menjadi kuat atau menjadi lemah sama sekali. Dan itu banyak sekali faktor yang mempengaruhi. Dan itu kita kaji bersama Eni, bersama Pak Yudi waktu itu. Eh, kira-kira apa yang membuat apa apa faktor lingkungan apa itu faktor diri mereka sendiri faktor lingkungan dan banyak faktor yang menyebabkan itu ada beberapa teori yang mengajarkan eh, mengenalan kita mengerti kenapa kemudian ada korban yang bisa keluar dari trauma ada korban yang tidak bisa keluar dari trauma dan faktor-faktor itu jelas memberi pengaruh yang sangat besar bagaimana korban menghadapi sebuah persoalan masa lalu dalam sebuah kontinuitas dalam perubahan eh, politik, ekonomi, eh, sosial dan budaya yang kemudian berubah sehingga masa sekarang. Saya pikir itu ya, itu yang bisa kita kasih Bu. Ya, ini merupakan proyek kita bersama dengan pendapatnya. <laughs> Ya, kita lanjutkan. Ini dari Pak Armansa. Apakah ada para ahli sejarawan Australia yang meneliti dan mengkaji kekerasan terhadap terhadap wanita penduduk asli Australia? So, is there like any researcher or historian, Australian historian who have done research on violence towards the Aboriginal people? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I... I'm not sure if I answered the question before that, but um, to answer this question, uh, yes. Um, I, there's a, a, if you mean like during the mass violence against Aboriginal people when white settlers came to Australia, yes. Um, there is research that's been done. I'm just trying to remember the name, uh, There's a big project looking at mapping violence against Aboriginal people during like the first 200 years of white settlement in Australia. And that's a project headed by uh, Lyndall Ryan Namanya. And she doesn't look at sexual violence exactly, but but her project is looking at different types of violence uh, against Aboriginal groups in Australia, like from the 1700s through to the start of um, like the 1900s. Yeah. So that, that might be a place to look. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Nidia, yeah. Uh, yeah. Untuk me- boleh ikut sedikit? Yeah, 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 sure. Boleh ikut sedikit? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, saya, sempat, saya sempat berteman dengan uh, peneliti uh, peneliti Australia yang kemudian eh, sedang melakukan proyek untuk aborigin. Jadi waktu itu eh, banyak sebetulnya sudah sudah banyak penelitian tentang tindak kekerasan terhadap aborigin dan perempuan aborigin tentu saja yang dilakukan dilakukan oleh peneliti Australia dan kemudian itu menghasilkan banyak sekali kebijakan-kebijakan termasuk kebijakan untuk memberikan banyak fasilitas kepada eh, orang-orang aborigin. Uh, karena persoalan-persoalan tindak kekerasan masa lalu. Kemudian orang aborigin diberikan banyak sekali hak-hak yang artinya privilege uh, kepada privilege oleh oleh orang-orang Australia. Uh, termasuk kemudian mereka mendapat hak untuk mendapatkan kerja yang jauh lebih uh, lebih lebih mudah dibandingkan uh, uh, yang setara white people yang setara dengan mereka. Itu itulah uh, kebijakan yang itulah yang kebijakan yang diambil dari hasil riset terhadap masa lalu apa yang dilakukan oleh white people terhadap orang aborigin. Saya sempat berteman akrab dengan uh, Juli saat itu yang menangani beberapa proyek dari hasil penelitian terhadap apa yang telah terjadi di masa lalu terhadap original. Nah, itu yang harusnya kita contoh sebagai orang Indonesia bahwa uh, apa riset-riset di masa lalu itu menghasilkan sebuah kebijakan terhadap uh, 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 peristiwa masa lalu baik ke, terhadap kedua belah pihak artinya persoalan masa lalu tidak digoreng terus menerus tapi dicarikan solusi jalan keluarnya jadi it, riset-riset yang ada harusnya menjadikan hasil kebijakan tentu saja untuk kita di Indonesia harusnya seperti itu nah 
ini yang 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 terjadi di di Australia bahwa riset-riset itu menghasilkan banyak kebijakan dan mereka belajar dari masa lalu. Saya tidak berada pada posisi bahwa saya karena sekolah di Australia kemudian berteman dengan teman-teman di Australia tidak. Saya berusaha untuk objektif untuk hal-hal tersebut. Jadi dia yes, jelas mereka telah melakukan. Mereka menyadari bahwa ada kesalahan di masa lalu, kemudian menghasilkan banyak kebijakan untuk itu. Sekarang kita yang sudah belajar, sudah menghasilkan banyak riset di masa lalu, harusnya juga menghasilkan kebijakan yang harusnya solutif untuk persoalan-persoalan yang selalu kita goreng di masa sekarang. Itu yang itu yang harusnya kita 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 perhatikan. Uh, saya pikir itu. Silakan Nidia. Ya. Ah, ya, saya bisa menambahkan sedikit. Saya dulu mengambil mata kuliah juga sejarah waktu di sini, Uni. 19th century, ah, abad 19 dan abad 20 sejarah Amerika. Jadi memang banyak membahas tentang aborigin. Mungkin hanya menambahkan jawaban dari Ibu uh, Yuni Narni. Uh, di Sydney Uni itu ada pusat Torres Strait Island uh, Center, kalau tidak salah namanya itu. Di mana... Uh, mahasiswa aborigin atau komunitas-komunitas yang apa boleh datang ke sana dan nanti uh, terus ini bisa mewakili ya suara-suara untuk uh, menyampaikan hasil penelitian mereka uh, perubahan-perubahan apa yang ingin disampaikan melalui komunitas-komunitas aboriginal karena di sini itu kota ya yang dulunya menjadi Sydney Uni sendiri kampusnya dulu uh, Pak Man adalah uh, dulunya itu lahan yang dimana orang aboriginal banyak tinggal kemudian mereka ya mengalami kekerasan genosida itu sendiri uh, yang juga mengalami sakit cacar dan juga mengalami kekerasan perempuan yang uh, anak-anak kecil diperkosa perempuan diperkosa oleh orang kulit putih uh, tapi uh, itu memang um, seperti ibu yang bilang sudah membawa banyak perubahan uh, hak-hak uh, orang-orang yang menjadi korban juga sudah menjadi perhatian dari pemerintah Australia. Nah, saya beruntung termasuk orang yang berada di kampus Sydney Uni melihat sendiri apa bagaimana itu dilakukan di sana. Uh, ya, mungkin Ibu Ani mau ada yang menambahkan tentang yang ini? Uh, thank you. Is um, no, not really. Uh, I I'm, I'm not an expert on Indigenous history in Australia. Mm -hmm. Um, except that um, there's a lot more that needs to be researched on the treatment of Aboriginal people in Australia um, because there's a lot of very serious ongoing consequences and intergenerational trauma for people uh, because Australia is still a colonised country The white people are colonizers and that's how we should think of yeah. ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Jadi karena mas, kalau Australia sendiri masih menjadi negara Commonwealth ya. Jadi memang masih banyak yang harus diselidiki dan dipelajari uh, karena itu juga sudah terjadi lama sekali ya sejak abad uh, 17 ya uh, pertama ketika uh, uh, bangsa Inggris uh, kapal pertama masuk ke Australia. Ya menarik sekali. Uh, kita lanjutkan kepada uh, pertanyaan berikutnya. Uh, is the violence for the women done by the men is also influenced by the attitude of women when she was in the outside thing? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess maybe this is about how women become complicit in mm -hmm. patriarchal structures. Yes. Yes, women are also part of the problem. Yeah, because uh, women take on the... The... Um, the the norms and we normalize yeah. what Normal patriarchal yeah. wants us to do which mm. we must resist so tolak patriarchy <laughs> <laughs> yeah resist so. first <laughs> Ibu uh, Ani mengatakan ya seharusnya menolak patriarkal ya yeah. <laughs> harus sama-sama laki-laki juga ikut menolak budaya patriarkal ya. Ada hanya satu kata lawan, that's right. <laughs> tolak patriarkal ya tidak aja perempuannya tapi laki-laki juga harus ikut menolak. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> ya, yeah. oke okay, kita lanjutkan. Ada lagi pertanyaan? Ini dari Alwi. Uh, saat terjadi perubahan gender untuk mengubah sikap dan apa yang lakukan organisasi dunia. Oh, okay. This is like what has been done by the world organization like a United United Nations um, uh, in dealing with this kind of uh, crime. Uh, 
Um, yeah. Uh, that's uh, I, not enough. Yeah. Tidak cukup. That is belum the belum cukup. Ya. Tidak cukup. <laughs> yeah. Jauh oh, yeah. dari cukup. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. There yeah. are. There are. Um, of yeah. course, there's bodies to deal with this. Yes, there are yeah. efforts that have been made with tremendous yeah. amounts of programs yeah. to try and yeah. address these things. But yeah, yeah. I think yeah. it's one of the things we have to yeah. work on. I'm sorry. Okay. It's a big yeah, question. memang memang ada ya sudah ada uh, badan yang di PBB untuk mengurus tapi terlalu banyak dan belum banyak yang juga mereka bisa kerjakan. Okay, saya pikir ini. Uh, ya. Kita bisa tutup lagi yeah. karena sudah uh, waktunya. Um, it's really an honor, uh, Henny. Thanks a lot for your uh, really, really uh, interesting and uh, valuable information that you have shared with us. Um, I thank uh, also to the all participants who are still with us until this time. More than 100, you know, 30 people who have joined us. Um, thank you very much uh, to Annie. We really appreciate. Hope you have a nice Sunday. <laughs> it's kind of a late Sunday now. <laughs> I really appreciate. I hope uh, fully we can meet sometime in Padang. Uh, next that time, you lovely. come to visit us. And I really. I also thank uh, a lot to the uh, com uh, committee of the History Department for inviting me to be the moderator for this uh, interesting discussion. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so I hand it to uh, the um, Devi or Fabriani, who is going to be in chat to close this um, webinar. Thank you very much, thank everyone. You. And I apologize if I make any mistake or comments during this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, silakan. Silakan. Ah, uh, silakan Febri. Ladies and gentlemen, finally we have reached the end of this program. Before that, uh, we would like to say thank you to Dr. Annie Pullman, who has shared her knowledge to us, and we hope the topic we have discussed today will be useful for all of us. Um, and also. Uh, we would like to say thank you to Ms. Dia Daya Iman Emily PhD, who has guided this interesting discussion. Uh, thank you, Ms. Dia. And thank sama, you sama. very much to all participants who have attended this webinar today. And on behalf of this committee, uh, we would like to apologize for any mistake we have made. At last, uh, we want to remind you about our next lecture program with Professor Dr. Phil Gustafsson, who talk about sejarah dan kreativitas bahasa orang Minang, or in English, history and language creativity of Minangkabau people, on the second of November 2020. And uh, before we break out from this room, uh, we will take photo together. So please turn on your camera. And thank you. And we close this program with Say Hamdala. Alhamdulillah, 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 foto bersama kita dulu sebentar, do you still have the data ini? Halo? Iya, 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 maaf, karena data saya tak habis, semalam. <laughs> uh, minta partisipan tolong dibuka apanya, uh, uh, apa? Uh, uh, kamera dihidupkan. Kameranya tolong dibuka. Kita foto Rizky, tolong difoto Rizky. Rizky. Tolong Siapa ya. Siapa yang ambil foto? Ya. Rizky. Rizky. Oke. Okay. Oke. Okay. Oke, okay, Rizky tolong difoto kameranya dibuka. Tolong difoto Ki. Oke. Okay. 1 2 3. Sudah Ki? Oke, okay, sip. Oke, okay. oke, okay, terima kasih sekali terima lagi. Terima kasih semua, terima kasih terima Bu Ani. Terima kasih banyak. Terima kasih, nice Sunday. Terima kasih Bu Fi, Pak Natona terima semua. Dia. Terima kasih. Mohon maaf kalau ada salah. Bye. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Bye. Ya, terima kasih Bu Ani. Terima kasih. Terima kasih semua. semua. Ya, oke okay, silakan yang mau keluar duluan. Thank you Ani. Ya, thank you Ani, Bu Fi, Pak Natona semua. Ya. Ya, yang mau isi absen silakan.
Nuki, you are still with us? Yes. Nuki. Okay. Nuki, you are still with, with us? No? Okay. Nah, silakan yang mengisi absen. Halo Pak Dalil Marjon. Ya Bu, selamat pagi Bu. Selamat pagi, terima kasih sudah bergabung Pak Purwo, terima kasih. Terima kasih. Silakan mahasiswa atau siapa saja yang ingin ingin mengisi absen, silakan kita masih waktu hingga eh, 10 menit ke depan, silakan mengisi absen karena ini akan bersangkut dengan eh, sertifikat. Terima kasih Ray, Ryan Rian. Ryan, oke. Okay. Ryan, you are still with us. Thank you very much to help. Sama-sama, Bu. My pleasure. Ya. Yeah. Rizky, thank you ya, Rizky. Oke. Okay. Sip, thank you. Daan, terima kasih Daan. We still have another yep. Yudi, hmm. Yudi, terima kasih, Pak Man, terima kasih. Thank you, Ren. Mm -hmm. Ada Ibu Marleni Liza kalau tidak salah dan Ibu. Iya, ada. Iya, college dari FIB juga ramai. Bu Eva, anak, Bu Eva hmm. tadi juga terima kasih. Bu. Ni Eva, ni Mida. Do you still with us now? Oke, okay, thank you very much for everything. Maaf, maaf. Leave duluan ya. Terima kasih Pak Dalil, terima kasih. Terima kasih Pak, silakan. Pak, Pak. Iya Pak. Silakan mahasiswa mengisi absennya. Masih ada waktu. Oke, okay, lima menit lagi. Pak Hayu, terima kasih ya. Pak Hayu, terima kasih. Hayu, you still with us, no? Anis. Terima kasih. Ya, ini ada Ibu Ina Yatul, ya. Terima kasih Ibu Ina dari Malang. Terima kasih Bu Ina sudah bergabung. Halo Bu Ina, Malangnya di mana Bu? Yeah. Oke, okay, uh, semua sudah mengisi absensi, kita bisa lift daan? Ya. Yeah. Oke, okay. oke, okay, see you ya.